the new wall. I now call this meeting of the Davenport Community School District Board of Directors to order. Can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Our board priorities, mission, and vision statement. Director Klein, Jerome, could you please read the board priorities? The Davenport School Board establishes the following priorities to ensure the academic success of all students. Provide leadership and direction to improve the overall learning environment in our classroom, schools, and district, including the health, safety, security, happiness of students and staff. Direct and support actions, programs, and activities which reduce the impact of poverty on our students, their families, and our community. Thank you very much. Director Potts, please read mission business statement. Mission statement, to enhance each student's ability by providing a quality education enriched by our diverse community. Our vision statement, education that challenges conventional thinking, prepares all students to compete in a global society, and inspires our students, parents, staff, and community to answer the question, what if? Thank you both very much. We'll turn presentations over to Superintendent Snuckler. Thank you very much. Up first, we have our restorative mediation presentation, and we have some guests with us here today that, that help make that possible. Um, to introduce and to give a kickoff, I asked Dr. Klipsch to come up and, and to get this presentation started. I will tell you, very few um, initiatives that we have have such a high success rate, and we're very proud of the collaboration that we have here today. So Dr. Klipsch, I'll, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think this is working. Oh, they're funky. They're funky. All right. Well, with me today, I have um, Jeremy Kaiser, as you can see, the director of the Scott County Diversion Programs, Michelle Bancroft, who is, uh, works in that programming as well as the program supervisor and the lead mediation facilitator. Um, Allison Holland, who is a school administrative manager at Williams, who has been a high implementer or, or utilizing this program quite a bit, as well as Guy Heller, the associate principal of Central. So each of them are going to have a moment in here to, to come up and speak about their experience. Jake, before you get going, yep. our, our team members that are with us today, this is also a discussion item linked down, down below if the board wanted to discuss this in between the board. But out of respect for their time, we wanted to do the presentation up front. So the question and answering of our leaders that are here, but then we can have a brief, we can have, we can also continue that discussion later on in the meeting. I wanted to remind our board members of that. Thank you for the, thank you for that. Sorry for the interruption. Thank you. So the overall purpose, and, um, and I'm going to try to speak through my, my portion of this fairly quickly to let them have their opportunity to speak about their experience with this and to allow you to answer, have some questions, um, is to reduce the amount of school removals, uh, impact disproportionality, increase student accountability, facilitate positive long-term solutions for students, and create a more safe and supportive learning environment for all of our students and staff. And as you listen to this today, I want to ground us back into those five constructs of the conditions for learning. You've heard about that quite a bit. Physical safety, emotional safety, and, and the other three that are up there. And as we think about these five constructs, and as we think about restorative mediations, restorative justice, um, I was reviewing this and thinking how this programming could impact each of these five areas. And, and you'll probably make those connections yourself, um, but that's really a guiding purpose of this work as well, is that it should have an impact on each of those five areas of the conditions for learning. So in brief, in, in, in very briefly, what is restorative justice? So in a traditional system, the focus is on what rule was broken and who broke it and what the punishment is. And in a restorative justice program, the focus is on who was harmed, what they need, and whose obligation it is to meet those needs. The parties in these mediations are, are brought together 
in a, in a mediation or sometimes in a conference circle if it, is a, if it has a larger impact on a community. Um, and all parties are able to learn about the why the event has happened um, and then develop a plan to repair, that, uh, to repair the harm uh, that has been done and ensure that it does not happen again. And that's where that increased accountability comes from. Um, we bring students together to really discuss that, say, what are you going to do differently? How are we going to resolve this? And what's the plan moving forward? A little bit about the program history. Sorry, this thing is a little touchy. So in February of 2020, uh, uh, Mr. Kaiser actually, with the diversion program, reached out to, to Davenport schools in this area. Um, they had been to, uh, so some, he and I and some other staff began developing programs in the hopes of April 2020 having a, a big kickoff. And as you recall, everything was shut down at that time. Um, so we weren't able to do that. And so we continued planning and preparations throughout 2020 into January. Um, and we uh, trained a cohort of our Davenport schools, juvenile court liaisons. And then in February 1st is when officially uh, we kicked this off and provided this as an opportunity for our secondary buildings. Um, in April, um, a second cohort of Davenport Juvenile Court liaisons, so we had some SSLs and some other staff, uh, were trained in this area. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the last day of the training was not complete because there was a different crisis on that day. And so we rescheduled and finalized that last day of training in September. And so these mediations um, continue with uh, increasing referrals and um, we've been discussing like how can we continue to meet the need of these referrals and the additional capacity that we need in our schools. This is just a quick overview of, of the referrals that we've received. So a principal will text me to say, hey, we have a, a, a mediation. Um, usually on, for, most of these so far have been preventative. We, we don't want uh, situations to escalate. There are students that are having conflict. We need some support. Um, and so I then would uh, reach out to, uh, to Mr. Kaiser, and then he kind of sends people to our buildings, and they work with the JCLs or whomever's trained in the building. To, and they're going to talk about that experience. But of those referrals, you can kind of see a quick breakdown of where those uh, referrals are coming from so far, um, which uh, Williams right now has been utilizing the program the most. And uh, that's why I invited uh, Allison Holland here to kind of speak to that a little bit. And then a little bit just, again, we started this last year from February till the end of the year. Um, but since August, since we started off this year, we've had 138 students involved in a mediation, unduplicated students um, involved in, in a situation. Um, you can kind of just see the breakdown. And, and again, in most of these situations, these are preventative in nature. We want, if we know the students are in conflict, they call for support, and they, uh, again, they'll, they'll talk about what that looks like, but they bring the students together to have that discussion on resolving that conflict, coming to a, a safe place to allow students to feel emotionally and physically safe in our buildings and allow them to focus on their learning. So that's uh, a little bit of the usage by subgroup. So now for the mediation process, I'm going to have Michelle Bancroft um, uh, come up and speak just for a second on what that process looks like from the lead mediator standpoint. Mayor. Uh, good evening. Thank you for your time today. Um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you to Davenport Schools, thank you to the administrators, thank you to the students, um, all of you opening our opening your doors and letting us in. This is a huge, um, you know, a huge step forward for Davenport Schools. Um, I think one of my favorite things about our program is it's voluntary, and you know, it, it's a choice for all those people I just said, the youth that we come in contact with. You know, we say to them, you don't have to talk to us. You don't have to work with us. The vast majority of them do. Um, there's only been a handful that have not been appropriate or choose not to work with our program. But, you know, they're doing it because they want to. Um, every youth that we come in contact with is different. Sometimes we can talk with youth one-on-one, -on -one, talk with the other youth involved one-on-one, -on -one, bring them together, have a mediation, and we can get it done pretty quick. Some of them, it's a multiple-week thing. So that's the beauty of our program. There's nothing set in stone. It's, it's different for each youth, and it's, it's specific to each youth, to their needs, and to make the best plan for them to move forward. 
Um, you know, we're unbiased facilitators that come in and like I said, in a short amount of time, we meet with youth, we build rapport with them. Um, they open up to us, their voice is heard, and you know, we, we go over their actions and you know, what choices could we have made better and how we're gonna move forward in the future. You know, that's, that's a lot of planning in a short amount of time, but it has such an impact. Um, the biggest things to me with this program, like I said, building rapport is huge, um, not, with our, not with just our students, but the students in the school. Um, the youth get to hear, get their voices heard. Um, they, they get a say in how they're gonna move forward and how they're gonna continue to get better. Um, accountability is a huge piece as well. So in order for a youth to participate, they have to own up to their actions. They have to acknowledge what they did wrong and try and not make those same mistakes again in the future. So when we bring both parties together, whatever that conflict was, both had a part in it, obviously. And to move forward, you know, we talk those things out, and that, that's hard. That's hard for some adults to do. So youth are learning in these small circles that we have about it's okay to make mistakes, but let's figure out a different plan so we don't continue to make them. We're working through the conflict, teaching them coping skills, um, and it's, it's a huge sense of security, you know, for youth that they often have a conflict with another youth. You know, resolving that conflict, it's a weight off their shoulders being able to go to school and feeling safe. Um, it's a weight off administrators' shoulders, you know, knowing these youth aren't having these conflicts anymore. Um, and the relationship building between those youth, between administrators, between school staff, between our staff is really impactful. Um, just a couple things to let these guys talk. Some things that really stuck with us, like I said, every case isn't perfect, um, every youth isn't perfect, but a few examples, you know, we've had youth that have had physical altercations in school and come and work with us. And that same day, they walk out, you know, laughing and walking back down the hall together. Um, I've, we've had youth that have come in and, you know, use profanity towards us and will not speak to us. And then by the end of it, they say, when are you coming back to see me next? Um, you know, we've had youth that have been leaders in their peer group, and they're now encouraging other others to change their way of thinking. Um, and then I think the most impactful that was pretty recent, one of the intermediate schools, uh, we worked with one of their eighth graders last year, and she's in high school now, and filled out a, a survey at school, like who are the youth that she, that she trusts, that she's comfortable going to, and she put one of our facilitators. So now he goes back and he checks in with her. So you know that's, that's the beauty of it, when we, when we talk with one on one with these students, bring them together, resolve that conflict, we continue to check in with them, continue to build those relationships, continue to help them to find people in their schools to, to help them be as successful as they can. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and so now we're gonna have a few of our building administrators come up. Uh, Guy Heller, the Associate Principal of Central, and Allison Holland, the School Administrator Manager from Williams, just to kind of provide on the building administrator side of things what their perspective is. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Allison Holland. I'm the School Administrator Manager of the SAM at Williams. Um, I did not realize our percentage was so high, but this is a program um, that I truly, truly believe in. So many times our students that are having conflict are repeat offenders. Um, so bringing in an outside resource um, that has that unbiased opinion of what is going on really helps the students work through those, those problems that they are having with each other as well as opening up and really talking about the cause of what really, really happened. Um, the other thing that I love when the fourth facilitators come in, whether it's Dave, DJ, Keith, or Michelle, um, they ask how kids are. You know, I worked with so-and-so. How are they doing? I haven't seen them back. Um, we have very few repeat offenders in the sense of the same problem. Um, we have had students that are repeat offenders um, and work with this program, but not necessarily with each other again. Um, so I thank you, Davenport, for allowing this to come in. Um, it has been great for Williams, and I see a lot of success with it. So... Um a couple of years ago, I was asked to go down and witness the training at um, JDC. 
and I, I saw the how the how it could impact the community and the kids and what they were doing in the community. And so I was a late comer to seeing how it would work in a school building. Um, and really, I have to give a lot of thanks to my wife, who said, you know, she works out in North. Said you need to call these people, have them come in on, and and work with your students who are having issues in the building. And so I did. And we what we do is we I give Jake a call or a text, just like he said, and then uh, the facilitators show up. And uh, we have had. I don't, I don't think we've had any repeat offenders uh, come back through. I don't think they've had to mediate the same group of kids and the same kids at all. I mean, um, and it's got to a point now where the word's getting around and kids are coming to us. You know, uh, we're having an issue. We, we would like to have it mediated. Could you have them come in? Um, we just had that last week um, a couple times. So really for us, it's being able to get out in front of the problem for kids to, to, when we see issues, ask the kids, hey, before this gets out of control, we would like to do this. We would like to have you have these people come in and, and help you work through the problems. And, and, and they're right. Some kids walk out. They walk in angry at each other. They walk out laughing, shaking hands, doing these kinds of things. Um, and the other part of it is that they didn't mention is how tenacious they are. Um, as you know, at the high school level, we have a problem with attendance at times. And so sometimes you have an issue with kids, and then they may not see them for another few days or whatever, but they keep coming back, and they keep checking in to make sure that um, they're seeing it through to the end, uh, to make sure that the kids are going through the whole process. And, and it has been a great value to us at Central. Um, we've used it quite a bit. The kid, something happens or whatever, we'll walk down the line of principles, mediation. Yeah, let's get them in. Let's get a mediation going. And so then... Uh, like I said, we text Jake and he comes up and, and the program has been just amazing for us and, and we really do appreciate the ability to, to have folks um, take a little bit of that off our plate and come in and, and help us out and help the community at large. So we thank you guys for that. Thank you, Mr. Heller. Um, so that, that is, again, just a brief overview of the program. So I would welcome um, any questions you might have for myself or for any of the other, again, Jeremy Kaiser, the director of the program, and our facilitators are all here. So any questions? Director Matt. Um, I know we're going to discuss this later, um, <clears throat> but just in case you all have to leave, um, when, it, when it comes up, are you, is there enough support? It sounds like this program is very successful and something we should make sure as a board that we keep going, at least so far. What type of, I mean, is there sufficient support? Is this something that we need to increase the number of staff? How, how are we doing in that respect? And if that can wait, that's fine. I just figured I'd throw that out there now. Um, in brief, we, Mr. Kaiser and myself are kind of in conversations quite a bit about finding ways to expand the capacity of this, but doing it in a way that is appropriate and, can, and doesn't, doesn't move too quickly that it's not effective. And so um, right now we've been, we've have a, we're having a lot of discussions about ways to do that. Um, so, but from the board perspective, just I just wanted you, and we all wanted you to make sure you're aware that this is happening and uh, there's great things coming from it. Director um, Boston. Will there be or is there any kind of tie-in with the youth leadership teams in the you know, buildings? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, right now I would be curious to know how our youth leadership teams are interacting with this. Again, so right now this is at the secondary level. Um, so there hasn't been a, a, a direct tie-in where they're given specific questions to ask at the youth leadership team about restorative, uh, the restorative justice program, uh, but it's certainly something that we could look into. That's a good, that's a good question. Anyone else have any additional questions? I didn't have a question, but I do have a comment. First of all, thank you all for this, and I like the fact that you're building the relationships with the students and making it easier to trust in their, you know, that shows in itself that they're willing to come to you when they have issues rather than being sought out. One question that I had, is there a limit to the sessions and how long are they? I'll turn that over to Dave or Michelle or Jeremy. Uh, 
there is not a limit. So like I said, um, that's one thing I really enjoy. You know, we could go in, talk with two youth, bring them together, two or three youth, depending on the amount, um, and get it done that same day. Um, depending on how comfortable the youth feels, um, how our comfortable comfort, how our comfort is with their um, feeling in the process, it can go as long as it needs to. So it's it's really unique to each student, um, to each school. It can be whatever you know the school is comfortable with, whatever we make it. So there is no limit. We just want to make sure, you know, the the students are comfortable, they feel safe, and they want to move forward and you know continue to re repair that harm. Um, but that's the beauty of it. It's whatever you need it to be. Okay. Thank you so yep. much for that. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. And I want to thank, again, the Scott County Diversion Program, Jeremy and his team, uh, because we're on different community groups and things. And, and Mr. Kaiser is the one that said, hey, we want to support the schools because what happens in the schools is good for our community. Um, so uh, it was through that partnership that uh, that this all got started. So it's a, a great community partnership between our schools and the agencies that are here to all support our kids. So thank you all. And I will piggyback on that. Um, Jeremy Kaiser wants nothing more than kids to be diverted um, and does an outstanding job in our community. And we are truly lucky to have him as a leader in our community to help divert some of those things. And his staff are right in line with that. And we can't tell you how much we appreciate that. Anytime we can, can, can divert violence into relationships, that just doesn't seem to be possible and you guys are doing it and we greatly appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you guys very much, very, very much appreciate it. And we will come back to this later in the discussion. So thank you guys for coming and um, Dr. Klipsch will handle the discussion at the very end. So please don't feel like you have to stick around for the whole, for whole piece of that. Um, the second presentation that we have today um, the Davenport Schools is, we meet every Wednesday on a two o'clock conference call with the Scott County Health Department. And today we have Dr. Katz with us here to help us um, uh, to have a discussion, a presentation around the current COVID levels in our community. Um, one of the things that we are constantly looking as our transmission rates in our community. And, and as they are coming down, we are entering in a conversation about masks and mask protocols. So we wanted Dr. Katz to come and have a conversation. So Dr. Katz, thank you so much for coming today. We invite you to come up to the podium. Uh, Dr. Katz has some information to share with us, and then um, we'll entertain any questions and kind of give a brief description of, of our next steps and how we plan to move forward. So or the advice that they give for us to move forward. So Dr. Kess, thank you so much for being here today. All right, am I audible with my mask on? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, so, you know, the pandemic started whenever that was, seems like a long time ago, um, at a time when um, there was a lot of conflicting evidence about the value of masks. You have to look pretty hard for a silver lining in the COVID pandemic, but we actually now, uh, after decades during my career of not being very confident about what masks do, have a much better idea, uh, largely due to research that's been executed during the last 20 or so months. Uh, the bottom line is we have good evidence, not great, but good evidence that masks work, leading to the CDC's current recommendation uh, during the Delta surge, uh, that everybody two years of age and up who is not uh, fully vaccinated should wear a mask in indoor public spaces. Um, this guidance is primarily for places with high or substantial uh, transmission. Um, those definitions are, are spelled out on the CDC website, and if anybody wants them, I can talk about them. But let me just in brief say that our current rates uh, are about threefold higher than, than the top end of substantial. So we're a long, long ways from uh, where the CDC would say we can start to back off on masking. Now the problem with the current CDC recommendations 
the main problem, the biggest problem that I see, is they haven't yet integrated vaccination rates um, in, into how we should look at those. That's critically important in age cohorts and spaces where vaccination rates uh, are very, very high. That is not the case in, amongst school-aged kids yet, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about that. It is true that um, the COVID is milder clinically in children uh, than in older adults, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't cause severe problems. We're at almost 2 million cases in kids under 18 in the country now. More than 20,000 of those um, are in Iowa. And the best uh, data available to date was presented at the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices uh, last week, suggests that amongst kids, uh, the underreporting rate is about sixfold. So for every case that's been reported, six infections have occurred. And the reason for that makes good sense if you think about it. Kids have fewer symptoms than adults. They tend to be healthier. Your immune and inflammatory systems are different uh, than adults. So the asymptomatic rate in kids, or the minimally symptomatic rate, is very high in comparison to adults. So if you don't get sick, you don't get tested. Uh, the CDC, in cooperation with a number of other institutions, it's done what are called zero surveys in a representative population of kids. And what they find is that somewhere just short of 40% of the kids in their zero surveys have already been infected at least once. Okay. Now, if there are 27 million school age kids, or 5 to 11, eight, uh, yeah, 5 to 11 age kids in the country, um, and and let's say 40% of them have already been infected. That's not 1.9 million infections. It's more like six or seven uh, million infections. So uh, the burden is significant. There have been um, about 8,300 hospital stays. One third of those are in kids with no underlying illnesses, no predisposing conditions, no asthma, not obese, no immune system defects, None of the common um, high-risk conditions that we all have heard about repeatedly. One-third of those 8,300 kids have wound up in an intensive care unit, uh, which usually means a need for uh, mechanical uh, ventilation. 150 deaths uh, in the 5 to 11 age group that was just approved for vaccinations, 2,300 cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome which occurs two to four weeks after the acute infection, including mild and missed infections, uh, out of the 5,200 that have been reported in total. Um, in the uh, Delta surge, 30% of the cases uh, have been in kids age zero to 17. Partly that's because it's much more infectious and kids may be slightly more susceptible the other reason is most of those kids haven't been vaccinated, wherein, whereas older uh, age cohorts, and particularly adults in my age cohort, which I ain't going to tell you what it is, um, uh, have very high immunization rates, we're protected. Kids are not protected because vaccination hasn't penetrated well. So there are about 30% of the cases in Scott County since the Delta surge started in uh, June and July. Uh, we originally didn't understand how much kids participated in transmission of the virus. Uh, research over the last six to nine months tells us that kids transmit the same as adults do, um, uh, at the, essentially uh, the same rates as adults do. So when kids uh, come into contact with high-risk individuals, whether in their own age groups or older, uh, they're very efficient vectors uh, of the infection. Would have been surprising if that weren't the case. It is true for every respiratory uh, infection that we're aware of. Uh, and uh, finally, from the clinical standpoint, um, long COVID, the 
prolonged symptoms following infection, including asymptomatic infection, somewhere in the 5 to 10 percent range for kids. The best data available is probably from the United Kingdom, where their estimates are 7 to 8 percent. So we're probably in that range, although uh, because different studies have used different definitions and surveillance techniques, we haven't pinned it down. But I think 5 to 10 percent is good. Masking is not just to protect the individual wearing the mask. And in fact, it's probably more important as source control. The virus is spread when you expel virus in secretions um, um, during uh, generally early in infection from three or four days after the infection starts until eight to 10 days after the infection starts. So the mask blocks the, the virus from getting into the air. There is protection as well of the individual wearing the mask. But the bottom line is that for masks to be effective, they have to be bilateral. The source and the susceptible individual both have to be masked uh, to get optimal uh, protection. Um, the uh, the uh, rate of unrecognized infection in all age groups is around 50%. It's higher than that in kids, probably. And as I told you, uh, we only recognize clinically one in six infections. So it's a huge reservoir uh, for transmission. The, uh, the data on the effectiveness of masks is really difficult to read. If you're not trained uh, in biostatistics and in particular in multivariable uh, analyses, it can be a really hard slog to understand what's going on in a fair uh, proportion of the uh, literature. What we have learned uh, since uh, early in the pandemic is, number one, that the benefits of mask usage are easiest to demonstrate with prolonged exposures indoors. That shouldn't surprise anybody. A respiratory infection in a closed space um, is clearly uh, going to be more transmissible than outdoors where dilution occurs very, very uh, quickly. So greater than three hours uh, involving relatively close physical contact uh, indoors, bilateral masking in those settings reduces the risk of transmission from an index infected individual to their contacts by about 50 percent. Not perfect, but very good. About 50 percent. The risk is reduced by about 70 percent uh, among fully vaccinated contacts of an infected uh, person. In school-aged kids, 12 to 17, uh, we have about a 50 percent penetration of immunization in that age cohort um, in Scott County. But as you're all aware, from uh, 11 on down, we're just at, at the very beginning with, with only a percent or two having been immunized uh, during the last uh, week. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, I had a long uh, conference call with people at the Iowa Department and a shorter call with representatives of the College of Public Health uh, in Iowa City today. And the first thing both said was to congratulate the Davenport Board for having the courage to do what we all know from a scientific and medical standpoint is correct, which is to require masks in um, indoors at school. Uh, so that was the first thing they said. Uh, and then the next thing they said was it's going to be really hard to come up with metrics that we can be confident of uh, to help inform decisions to start to back off. That said, everybody's on board to participate in the effort. Um, the metrics that we're considering at this point, of course, are community transmission rates that are currently about threefold higher than any reasonable a threshold to begin backing off. Hospital resource use, because it's extremely objective. There are all kinds of vagaries with who gets tested, whether it gets reported, uh, whether mild infections ever get a test at all, and those sorts of things. Hospital resource use is very good. 
we pretty much know who's in the hospital with COVID on every given, on any given day. Over the last seven to 10 days, that's going up, despite the fact that cases in the community look kind of stable. And we think this relates to two things. One, that um, it's an increasing and increasing proportion of the infections is in kids who tend to not get very sick, so they don't get tested. And the increased use of, of home tests, self-administered, parent-administered tests that never get reported. The clinical laboratories and the state hygienic laboratory are required by law to report positive tests. That doesn't happen with rapid antigen tests that are done in the home. And so we think we're having a progressive decline in the sensitivity of our case counts for knowing exactly um, what's going on. So community transmission rates are important. They will definitely be a piece of it, but, but we're concerned about how accurate they will be as time progresses. Hospital resources, school-based outbreaks, but they're very hard to document because the kids aren't very sick and if they don't get tested, proving the association can be difficult. We're very excited about trying to make respiratory symptom-based absenteeism be important. That will capture symptomatic COVID. As we move into flu and RSV season, it'll, it will capture uh, those as well. So that, that's very valuable. We'd like to be able to test in the schools, but we have a good experience, well, we have an experience last year in Bettendorf uh, where we had great difficulty getting any significant number of parents to permit their kids, their healthy kids, or symptomatic kids to be tested. So we're not really thinking too hard about testing in the school, in the schools. If, if I had any indication that we could have a better participation level than we had uh, last year, I would rethink that. Uh, test positive rates in the schools, that is, kid calls in absent, and says his COVID test is positive, are confounded by any systematic uh, testing uh, and, and the large proportion of kitty cases uh, that are asymptomatic. And then immunization status, which we get, we can, we can get most of that data uh, from the Iowa immunization repository so we can track immunization rates by age uh, over time. So we plan, College of Public Health, um, IDPH, the health department in cooperation with TJ and his uh, staff uh, to develop a matrix for presentation to the administration of practical metrics that can be accumulated with relative ease we want to have it available well before Christmas uh, so that as we get past the surge that we're expecting in November and December and into January when things calm down again, um, uh, we can uh, begin to back off on uh, mask requirements. I don't think we're there yet, but we're going to meet the, the, uh, the school system uh, in the middle and, uh, and be ready for um, uh, a time, hopefully within not very many weeks, where we really see uh, reproducible metrics in the community that suggest we're getting ahead of things. Vaccination, get those kitties vaccinated. Uh, we will, um, we will uh, cooperate with anybody in the school system that's interested in school clinics. But in point of fact, most parents want to be able to sit down with their kid's provider and have the discussion about vaccination. So we're not really in a position at this point to offer uh, mass vaccination clinics like we did at the original rollout in January, February, March of last year. So that's what I had to say. I could say a lot more. Uh, but questions now, TJ, or what? Any questions, Director Bent? Um, first of all, thank you for for sharing. Um, I think we're all looking forward to when we can make adjustments. Um, so we've just now, students have just now, or kids five to eleven have just now been 
allowed to be vaccinated. And you said you don't think um, clinics in the schools like we do with flu shots or used to do with flu shots are going to be particularly effective. I guess I'm just trying well, to Well, they could be very, very effective, but, but there's a lot of uh, credible polling data that tells us that parents primarily want these shots delivered in the presence of the primary provider of the child okay. and with the parents present to have the dialogue. So I don't think it's as simple as it was uh, last January, February, March, when consenting adults lined up at Sears and we gave thousands and thousands of shots. As I said, if the district is interested in school-based clinics, we'll sit down and talk and try and make it happen. Okay, thank you. Did anyone else have any additional questions? Thank you, Foster. You've been a strong proponent of masks for quite some time. Um, are you eventually, are you going to be a proponent for uh, vaccination mandates? Oh, that's a really fascinating question. First, remember that in February of last year, I was not a mask proponent. I look like all of us in public health, or most of us in public health did, at the two prior serious coronaviruses, the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 1, that you'll remember from over a decade ago, and the Mideast Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. Uh, and they were never transmitted by asymptomatic people. So we thought, you know, if you're sick, you stay home. In public, if you're well, why wear a mask? We were wrong. And the reason that we were wrong was because there's so much transmission by asymptomatic people with this new virus, number one. Uh, and number two, um, um, people are transmitting before they get sick. So we used the prior coronavirus as an example, and we were just flat wrong. It was in mid-March that I realized that. And so, yeah, I'm a very strong uh, proponent of masks. Vaccine mandates are another interesting issue. So, you know, I got a day job at the blood center as well. We have a vaccine mandate in that healthcare institution. We're well over 90% immunized. It's, it's a mandate. You can't work for us, with very few exceptions, if you haven't been fully immunized. The safety, the body of safety literature in adults is many, 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 many times larger and longer than the safety record in 5 to 11-year-olds. And I think we're weeks and months away from serious consideration of immunization mandates in school uh, for a number of reasons. One, I want more long-term safety data. I'm very confident that that long-term safety data is going to look great. There's absolutely no biological plausibility to expecting otherwise. But if we make a mistake, we will damage not just the COVID immunization initiative, but all other immunization initiatives in childhood, and that is unacceptable. The clinical risk to an individual child with COVID-19 is so much less than the clinical risk to somebody my age that the risk benefit for a mandate, the risk benefit considerations for a school mandate, I don't think we're there yet. Talk to me on January 1st. I think by January 1st, we're gonna have robust data. Uh, but I'm not there yet. Any additional questions? Dr. Foster. We keep looking back at this, and to me, this is nothing but politics. Okay, we're using our, our children as political footballs. And so, you know, there's data out there that says the only protection you're going to get from a mask is if you use an N90 mask, okay? So, and you commented earlier, okay, if you're, if you're wearing a mask, you're not going to have full protection unless everybody around you is wearing a mask. Oh, everybody is a big word. 
Okay. Well, again, I, I just think um, we're playing politics here. Well, yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from, Mr. Poshin, but I disagree. I mean, the data is sound now that masking in schools, I have a list of seven or eight references I'll send to you guys and, and you can go through them. And um, the, uh, the evidence is clear. We can reduce transmission in schools by around 50% with masking and three feet of distance between the students during that prolonged contact in the classroom. That's not politics. That's, I think, reasonably established on the totality of the evidence. Madam Chairwoman, point of order. Yes. 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 Director Fox. <laughs> you had mentioned in your in your presentation that you're you've been working with uh, administration, either our district or other districts, for a, a, a basically a mask exit strategy. Yeah. Could you could you flesh that out a little more for me, if possible? Well, yeah, it's hard. A year ago, before vaccination, my metrics for backing off on masking in indoor venues was five cases per 100,000 per day. So that's uh, five, 35 uh, per 100,000 per week. The bottom of substantial at CDC is 40. So same, right? And a test positive rate of 5% or, or less. Those metrics are not terribly useful anymore because of underreporting that's getting worse, particularly with, with home testing. I'm not against home testing, but it distorts what we understand about the epidemic. And the test positive rate, uh, the, same, uh, the same issue, is that the positive tests in the denominator, the number of positive tests over all the tests, we're losing control of that as testing becomes decentralized. So my old metrics are not good. They don't integrate immunization. If we got to 70%, where there's pretty good data that says in enclosed spaces with 70% immunization rates, you begin to drop transmission. At 90% and above, you may stop it. Then there's the other problem of how long has it been since you're vaccinated. We're just learning that. But I'm pretty sure that that level of protection is good for six months anyway. Uh, I'm not sure it's six months, but I'm, I think it's in that range. So we're trying to integrate that stuff on the fly. Um, and, and high quality data don't exist. That is not an excuse to not act. And, and so we want to come up with a proposal that the school district and public health can agree upon to allow us to back off. And that depends on us being able to count cases with reasonable accuracy. If we back off and things get worse, we need to know that. Uh, so that's really what we're working on, um, and it's we're it's thin ice. The data that allows us to pick metrics that we will respond to when we reach them is still pretty thin. Uh, I, how many kids in ICUs is too many? That, you know. Dr. Beck. Oh, I'm not the chair. Here. I apologize. <laughs> um, so thinking about, um, you mentioned an exit strategy, thinking about an exit strategy, um, which I'm hoping comes sooner than later. Vaccinations are going to, more vaccinations are going to be able to help us get to that sooner. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then, of course, in the future, we'll have to think about how long that lasts, but we don't know yet. Okay. Um, so you mentioned something about respiratory symptom-based absenteeism. So could you explain that a little bit? My interpretation is that when you feel you have any symptom, like a cold, or 
respiratory illness that you're suggesting people stay home? Yeah, well, I did that before there was any such thing as COVID. I don't think sick kids should come to school. They make other kids sick. Okay. So, yeah, but tracking that, not, not a number on a given day per se, but tracking trends over time and integrating that with things like uh, case rates for COVID in the community, um, all, all the things, vaccination rates and whatnot, uh, is probably three or four different metrics that we have to establish thresholds for and come up with a, common, uh, a way to interpret a combination of metrics that will allow us to safely start to back off. So you're, you, you meant the number of people who are home, number of students home because of respiratory symptoms, whether they're whatever they're for. Yeah. Okay. It's nice to know who's got COVID, absolutely. But that's not going to be sensitive or specific uh, because of all the issues with testing and surveillance that, that I'm talking about. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions? Dr. Katz, thank you so much for coming and presenting today. And as you heard Dr. Katz say, we, we are going to be working together and continually updating the board, and we will find common ground because this this isn't going anywhere. And so that's that's the goal as we move forward with, with some of those metrics that, that are um, – uh, uh, that our Scott County Health Department can stand behind and also other UEN's urban education networks like Davenport are, are going through the exact same thing. So we're not going through this alone and, and we will find a, a, an acceptable uh, framework as the vaccinations become available and the transmission rates decrease in Scott County. So Dr. Katz, thank you so much for coming today. It's, Greatly we've looked at what's being done in other school systems and we're not happy with any of it. We don't think that they're objective. Um, probably not reproducible. So we want to come up with something that we can do on an everyday basis and will be reasonably precise. Thank you, Dr. Katz. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Vice President, may I ask um, that we move up from the superintendent's report to this report? It's another presentation, but they weren't allowed, they weren't able to come until later on in the presentation, but now it's later. So we have another presentation, uh, uh, for our foreign exchange student presentation. If you would be, if you would allow that to to happen right now, I think it would be more beneficial for our students and families. If you're okay with that, that will be fine. Okay, um, Dr. Barney, if you wouldn't mind, one of our board requests that we had was to give an update on our foreign exchange um, students that come to our district, and we are very lucky. Um, Anybody that's gone through high school and known a foreign exchange student, it really can change your life, bring bring a global perspective. And, and in terms of Davenport schools, I think this is something that we do an excellent job of. And, and it really does um, add to our diversity in our district. So, uh, Dr. Barney, if you wouldn't mind introducing our, our program here today. And thank you for letting us uh, move this up for the convenience of our of our families and students. Thank you. Dr. Barney? Yeah, so this evening we have Emerald uh, who's going to walk through her program that she's connected with. There are several programs that kind of feed foreign exchange programs um, across the state of Iowa. Um, we have several that are here in the area, but Emerald's going to talk about her program this evening. Um, and then she brought with us some uh, students that are currently here visiting us from some other countries as well. And she's also going to talk about a program that allows uh, students from the U.S. to travel abroad as well in the same type of manner, uh, along with uh, some scholarship opportunities to support that. So uh, we'll turn it over to Emerald. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, um, so my name is Emerald Johnson. I am a local coordinator and a 13-time host mom to international students. Um, I also brought with me a bunch of families and students that are here this year in case they you ask a question that I can't handle and I will turn it over to them. Um, it'll be really good to have the student's point of view and the family's point of view. Um, I have been hosting international students since 2012. When I was first asked about it, I thought um, exchange was for people to like trade kids, <laughs> you know, and I'm single and I didn't think I would even qualify as a single person. Um, but I agreed to meet with the, with the representative and I sat down and she saw my house, we had a talk, and then three weeks later I had kids. <laughs> so it happened really fast. Um, it has been really um, a life-changing thing. So this is something, after I hosted my seventh kid, um, the first five were college scholarship students. 
Then I had a year off and I went to visit um, some of my kids that I had hosted in Central America. And um, I was able to see just the way that this exchange program changed their lives and I got to know their families. Um, I stayed in their homes for two weeks and I came back and I realized I wasn't done with exchange. So I found this high school program that I now work with. Um, my first year, these are my two daughters up here. They're both named Noor. I now understand why you don't name your kids the same name. It gets confusing, um, but it was great for us. So um, how do I find the button to play it? Oops. There should be a play button on here. Okay, I guess I'll just roll through, no, this is, so, Amy, this is it converted into a PDF, so. Oh, so that's why. It's yeah, so it, it will I not want. play. I see that this is a Prezi now that you're saying that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to be totally weird, but that's okay. So I made this presentation when I first started being a local coordinator because um, we have presentation nights at my, at my home, and I let the kids talk about their country, but then I also thought it was important to start educating the general public about why exchange matters and what it takes to be a host family and all these things. So this is actually supposed to be so totally different than this, but that's right. Um, these kids come and they live with strangers and they speak in a language that they didn't learn as a child and they eat different foods and they have to just trust this family to guide them. We are volunteer host families. We could never do this without them. They agree to take on the challenges of um, supporting these students for an entire year. They do not get compensation at all. Um, they receive $300 in assistance, and as soon as you buy a pair of athletic shoes and a winter coat, that's pretty much gone. Um, those are all just pictures. Exchange statistics. There are 1 million international students in the U.S. every year. Most of those are college students. Um, about 30,000 of those are high school students. These are all pre-COVID, so it really went down the last couple of years across the board. Um, most of the high school students are from Europe. Most of them are on paid programs. That means their parents at home are paying um, an organization to place their kids um, with a family here. All of the students that I work with have been scholarship students. And right now there are two scholarships um, that are active. They're US State Department scholarships. There's FLEX, and that is mostly um, Eastern European countries. That was uh, established after um, the Soviet Union to reconnect United States citizens with citizens from these countries after we had been out of communication for so long. Um, so the YES program actually was inspired by the FLEX program. Um, after 9-11, Kennedy and Luger senators got together and said we need a scholarship that works just like flex did with all these other countries there's so many places we need better communication with so that's where these scholarships came from um, these are the student challenges they come here and they have to live without the support of their natural parents for the first time in their lives these kids are 15 16 17 years old um, most kids cannot do this they cannot handle this it's a big deal um, they struggle with some homesickness uh, they struggle with living in a completely foreign place. Every aspect of life is different than home. Um, they have to speak English all day long. Um, I usually let mine take a nap after school because their brain is just so tired for the first few weeks. Um, they learn to live with strangers, relying on strangers, which in many cultures is not common. You don't trust a stranger like family. You, you, keep, you have a small circle. It's not like in the U.S. where we just talk to everybody. Um, in fact, my kids often think I know everybody just because we say hello to strangers. Um, they have to adjust to the new family structures, the new school regularities. So in most countries, the students stay in the room and the teachers travel. The students do not. So that is a big challenge. And being on time to class, also a challenge. Um, adjusting to new foods, foods are very traumatic for our kids. <laughs> they eventually love them, but it takes a little bit of adjusting. <laughs> Student experiences, they live with a family, and that family becomes a second family for the rest of their life. Um, I don't think they realize that's going to happen when they sign up for this, but that's what happens. They receive a full immersion in American culture, and it isn't what they expected. They mainly have been watching TV and movies and thinking that that was going to be their life, and it is not. 
They develop friendships with American teens. And as you can see in this room, um, they develop friendships with teens from all over the world, which is a really great bonus. A lot of my families, because I've double hosted forever as a single person, I don't want to home alone, so I always get two and they can hang out to, together. Um, I guess I make it look fun because I have three double placements this year and I'm not one of them um, because I had an exchange daughter come back for college and I just can't handle three. <laughs> uh, some of the things that come out of it is these students gain independence, resiliency, confidence, and they become so much more responsible. Um, some of the new things for them are snow. Many of our kids come from tropical places. The first time they see snow is amazing. Um, they're out there in their pajamas and their cell phones taking pictures of flurries. Um, my first kids thought sleet was snow and they went outside in dresses and they danced and took pictures in a sleet storm um, <laughs> before I could get home and correct them. In the morning I showed them what snow was because it actually happened and they thought maybe that the movies just got it wrong and this is what snow was. Um, they have to adjust to pets. Um, they get to learn about American holidays. So these are some of our kids. Um, this is when I went to El Salvador to visit my second exchange daughter. These are her nephews. Um, we went to um, a historic place down there. Uh, this was a welcome party for these two are my daughters. And then, um, so we had Thailand, Egypt, South Africa, and Pakistan <coughs> represented there. This is the first year I hosted high school programs. We encourage them to give presentations like this about their countries because they're here to be ambassadors for their cultures as much as they are to learn about ours. So I didn't know how to do this, so I just tracked down other exchange students in town and had house parties and let them all give presentations. So in this picture, we had Saudi Arabia, um, Cameroon, Kuwait, and Pakistan. Um, this was, I took the kids all to Eid celebration at the mosque that year. Um, that was, it's been fun to learn about that too. Host families, you can be empty nesters, you can be married couples with teens, married couples with small kids, married couples with no kids, unmarried couples, or a single like me. Um, if you're gonna host a student, we do background checks because these are international teenagers. Um, you have to be able to support the student. The only real requirements, physical requirements, are that they have a bedroom, a place to study, uh, reasonable privacy, and meals. And then you're supposed to welcome them as a member of your family, not as a guest. So um, they get chores, they follow your rules, they have a bedtime if you're feeling like your kids should have a bedtime, um, whatever. They get a scholarship, they are all on scholarship, so they receive money for their spending. So they get about $125 a month, so they pay for their own movies, bowling. If they want fast food with their friends instead of eating your food at home, then they can pay for that. Um, Okay, we missed a lot of slides, but that pretty much covered most of it. Um, my program is a placement agency called Iowa Resource for International Service. We do the recruiting in Tanzania and in Nigeria. So all the students from Nigeria or Tanzania that come here are IRA students, even though we don't place them all. Um, my organization places across Iowa, and then I can actually place in this, uh, Western Illinois. I can place within 100 miles of my home. Um, tonight we have three families here and one, two, three, four, five students. Um, I'll maybe have them stand up. We have Nil, she's from Turkey. Deja's from Mali. Fatima is from Nigeria. Yafa is from Palestine. And Hamza over here is from Pakistan. I don't know if you had specific questions in mind or if I answered a lot of them or questions for the kids. Do you, mind you, up here? Do you have your students come up? Yeah, you guys want to come up? Do the board have any questions? Director Snyder. My question is for the students. I'd like to know like how long ago did you know that this was something you wanted to do and how did, how did you know that that was something you wanted to do? Um, I got to know about this three years ago and then I applied for this and then that's how I'm here. <laughs> okay, another thing is, 
last year, everything got canceled because of COVID and everything. Um, we had a virtual program and Hamza actually was on our virtual program. We had to make it up from scratch. <laughs> it was all like with apps and it was really crazy, but we did a really good job. Yeah, yeah. And then we got a surprise. And so he was actually virtually placed with this family. And then this year we found out he got to come. So he got to be a virtual kid of them and then he got to come in person. So that was really special. I got two certificates. Yeah, so he's, <laughs> he's gonna be a double alumni. <laughs> um, anybody else wanna talk about when, why they came or how uh, you found out? I've always wanted to travel the world. So when I heard about this program, I was like, yes, I'm applying for that. <laughs> So this is a scholarship. They didn't pay for this. This is all free. So I heard about this program also with ch when I was chatting with my friends, and they told me that there's a program like program like this. So I was like, yeah, I wanted to try a new life. Like everything was new, a new culture. So I was like, yeah, I'm down. And I didn't expect this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear this program mm -hmm. from my dad. He told me about it, and I thought that it was a great opportunity to like mm -hmm. meet new people, to come to a new country and um, learn about um, um, the culture and also share my culture. I got to know about this program to my school. I came in like through my school. Uh, surprisingly, I passed the processes and. <laughs> With COVID, I never expected like for the program to happen, but I got to bed and here I am with 11 families. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk about like what the process was for your interviews yeah. and stuff, maybe? Yeah. So you first fill a form. Mine was like a form. And then you go for the first round of the exams. After the first round, there's a second round, which includes autist tests, that's listening, speaking, reading, writing. And then there's an interview, that's like interview like for your whole country, like the people from different states come and then you get your interview. And the next process is the visa interview. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then you fly. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any additional questions? <laughs> Director Conjuron? Do the credits that you take here um, in the Quad City area, do they get counted as credits back in your home schools or how does that work? Um, normally, this does not count for their school. They have to take a gap year. Um, and a lot of kids struggle with that. Um, but by the time they get to the end of the year, they always agree that it was more than worth it um, because they just, they go through so many changes. This is a very challenging thing to do. Um, they grow a lot and that's like my favorite part of this is because they have no idea what's gonna happen when they get here. They don't, I mean, I never know exactly what's gonna happen, um, but I know that when they get to the end of the year, they're just gonna look back and everything is different. Um, but yeah, some of the kids get credit, most of the kids do not for this program and they do not get to graduate here um, no matter what grade they're in. Um, so, but they can use their transcripts to look good on college applications. And that does help too, to show that you are able to adjust to a different educational style um, and, and take classes in a non-native language. Those things can have value later on, even though you don't get technical credit. And the reason is because their school at home is so different. Um, they don't have electives, <laughs> they don't have gym class, so any of those things wouldn't even translate. They just are doing the core subjects all day long, all the time. Director Poston. Director Poston. Now, uh, which schools are you attending? I see one of you have a Davenport Central shirt on, so I assume you're at Davenport Central, but the rest of you, which schools are you in? Uh, I'm in Davenport West High School. I'm in Davenport West too. Not. And I have one more at um, West. Um, she's my host sibling, so we're both at the same school. And I also have families here, if you have any questions for any of them too. They have been huge advocates for exchange. Um, they've all hosted before, they're repeat hosts. Director Snyder. 
I don't have any other questions, but I am really glad you guys are here. I hope that this is something that will stick with you the rest of your lives. I mean, this is an incredible opportunity. And I can only think from the host families, um, once you guys go back home, how much they would miss you. That would, that would be very tough. Um, but I think it's an unbelievable experience for everybody involved. And I am very, very glad that you guys got the opportunity to do this. Yeah, we thank you so much for supporting the um, So to get the full, full experience, I guess you probably have had a chance to travel at least maybe to Chicago or maybe could. It's hard when, when, when there's a pandemic, I guess. It kind of depends on what your host families are doing. They went to Chicago with a school trip okay. a couple weeks ago. Good. Um, and do you guys do extracurriculars and play sports or do orchestra or anything like that too? So all in. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome. We're happy to have you here. And thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Do the whole families have anything to add? Okay, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. Now we'll move on to board reports. Are there any board reports? Director Klein John? Um, I just have a quick question too. We skip over student board reports. Are we not having student board members? We are having student board members. We are working on uh, getting the student board members now. There's going to be an onboarding, and we are going to onboard our students, um, board members, on the 22nd. Okay. Um, and also, um, today I attended Harrison School's Veterans Day um, program. It was outside, very nice weather, um, songs, poetry, and they recognized every veteran that was there and what their connection was to somebody at Harrison, a grandpa or a kid. Or, so it was a very nice program. Okay, um, foreign exchange students, before you all leave, is it possible that we could get a picture of you? I'm sorry, Director Klein, Jerome, we'll get back. No, I'm done. Okay. I'm done. Do you want the full board? Do you I'm so sorry. Um, can I talk about real quick the scholarship for U.S. kids? Oh, yeah. Yes. And that's really important. Okay, so our scholarship is yes, but there's also a scholarship called Yes Abroad, and that's for U.S. students who want to study abroad, and it's for free. So a lot of times, study abroad is very expensive, and people get priced out of it. And almost no Iowans use this, so I've been really trying to push my schools to let kids know about it. Uh, the deadline this year is in December, so if you go online to Yes Abroad um, and you have a teenager who is mature enough to handle this kind of thing, you don't have to speak the language there. They give you an immersive language course, um, and then you just sort of do like my first kids. They didn't come with English, and we just had to mime a lot of things. So um, it's a really great opportunity, and very few Iowans use it, but Iowa hosts more exchange students than any state per capita in the country, so more of our kids should be doing this. So go look for Yes Abroad. Okay, thank you very much for that. 
Is there any additional board reports? Thank you. Dr. Poston. Uh, earlier this, this evening, um, I attended a seventh grade girls basketball game at, at Walcott School, and at halftime, a presentation was made uh, to the 1966 um, ninth grade boys basketball team um, uh, that were city champs. Uh, and then that those uh, many of those players um, went on to be uh, starters at Davenport Central and then went on uh, to the state tournament. So I want to thank Principal uh, Garnica for helping with that and participating with that. A plaque was presented that will hang in uh, walk at school and uh, uh, just wanted to pass that along. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anyone else? Director Beck? Um, I think it was a week ago or so, I attended the Creative Arts Academy Fall Festival and they had um, a display of visual arts, um, some incredibly talented students they had a number of uh, music performances and also um, some theater performances. So it was a really wonderful experience for them to be able to show off some of the work that they've been doing at the Creative Arts Academy. Great, thank you for that. Anyone else? Okay, moving on to communications for Open Forum. Open Forum is a time for members of the community to give input at a board meeting regarding school district issues or concerns. Individuals who want to speak, please fill out the Open Forum request and give it to the board secretary prior to Open Forum. The form is available in hard copy for in-person attendees or on the school board page of the district's website for those who want to participate virtually. Virtual participants must email their request to Brenda T at tbrin at davenportschools.org by 3 p.m. on the day of the board meeting. The board will not act on any issues presented during open forum if it is not published on the agenda item. Iowa Open Meeting Law prohibits action on any issue that is not on the agenda. I'll set the amount of time allowed for individuals to speak. The board asks that no charges or complaints be made against individuals, employees of the district or community. Remarks that reflect negatively on the character or motives of any person will be called out of order. To participate virtually, call 563-445-5001 and enter the conference ID 9730561. I have four requests today and we'll give you two and a half minutes for that. And if you would come up in the order that I call you and state your name and address. Michael Elliott, Lori Yonke, Marcus Bolin, and James Quinn. Hello, my name is Michael Elliott, 1906 West 3rd Street. I appreciate the extra half a minute. We're getting somewhere now. Maybe we'll get to three minutes and eventually maybe even five minutes to let parents speak. That'd be awesome. Uh, I had a few things to talk about, but uh, with, of course, the limited time, I got to figure out which is more important to talk about. The um, I'm the uh, chairman of the formerly called Freedom to Choose Political Action Committee of School Boards and um, now called the uh, voice of parents. So we're providing a voice for the parents because unfortunately it seems like the board is um, underrepresenting parents, of course, with the <laughs> two and a half minutes now. So I had a bunch of things I wanted to say, but with uh, King Katz of Scott County speaking, he totally changed my outlook of what I wanted to talk about. So I have, uh, I'm gonna talk about viruses, I guess, and masks and all that, so. Um, Viruses weren't discovered in 2019. Uh, we've known and understood viruses and transmission for 150 years now. If masks worked, we would have been using them for 150 years now. Since COVID for the last two years can easily compare, uh, we can easily compare locations with uh, masks and without mask mandates. We can, as, as a result, we can see there's no significant difference whether you wear a mask or not. 
we can see that after the last two years. Um, so you can keep getting so-called experts to try and gaslight the public. But we all know that anything outside of a spacesuit really does little to stop respiratory viruses every year for as long as we can remember. I mean, pop, pop culture has it in a day, like it's just part of our pop culture when we see movies. If there's a, any kind of virus outbreak or alien invasion, it's immediately guys in spacesuits. You know, nobody in their right mind would wear that mask and go into a situation where there's a deadly virus. Nobody in the right mind. I sure as heck wouldn't. And I've been in the military. I'm very familiar with gas chambers, and biological chemical warfare. Uh, I've worn masks that actually do protect you from that kind of stuff. Uh, it's nowhere near what you're wearing. Um, you have to fit, clear your mask. It has to go through a protected filter. <laughs> the cloth stuff is garbage. I mean, it's, it's all pretend. Unfortunately, it's like political theater. So it's really sad that you have, like I said, so-called experts coming up here and trying to gaslight the public. Thank you. But we all know what works and what doesn't. Your time, Thank you, sir. Mr. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori Yonke. I think she left. She left. Marcus Bolin. Marcus Bolin, 2830 Cedar Street, Davenport, Iowa. Uh, I've sat up here and presented stuff to you that's been scientific data about masks and the kids. The kids are being harmed by everyday use of wearing masks. I mean, if you can go and talk to psychiatric, pediatric psychi psychiatrists, and you're seeing more and more kids with mental health issues, and it's all related to the mask. I think that far supersedes fake wearing of the mask to prevent something, prevent something that is not working for viral spread. These kids are hurting. They're not learning. I used to have three honor roll students before this last year. Their whole lives, they've been honor roll students. They're struggling immensely. They are removing themselves from my questions, from asking what's wrong, nothing. There is something wrong. And I'm serious about this, guys and gals. I'm sorry, Dr. Beck. But they're hurting more immensely from wearing these masks on everyday use versus viral spread prevention. I want to read to you CDC website. If you are familiar with the VAERS reporting, okay, since we're talking about in the future, Dr. Beck mandating fire, uh, vaccines in schools, you were brought it up earlier tonight. No, I did not. You asked, no. you brought it up to Dr. Point, Katz. Point of order. Point of order. Okay, I'm just going to, this is why I brought this up. All right. December 14, 2020 through November 1st, 2021. During this time, VAERS received 9,367 reports of death among people who received the COVID-19 vaccine. That's just what's been reported in the last year. And now we're talking about mandating kids. You have no data that proves that this experimental vaccine is safe. They have no data for fertility they didn't test fertility through this vaccine. And now we want to mandate it on our kids? It's not going to happen, OK? We're not doing a mandate for vaccines. It should be choice only, OK? And that's all I got to say. Choose wisely. Thank you so much, Mr. Bowen. Mr. Quinn. James Quinn, 3536 West 29th Street. Have you ever heard the story of the emperor's new clothes? Have you heard that? Yeah. You know, let's, let's just stop the rhetoric, okay? You guys are all educated people up there. You all know that mask that you're wearing right now does nothing. You've heard us present testimony and reports 
and research. And you haven't heard it from a doctor. You've heard it from someone who actually had to use masks to save their lives. These masks don't do anything. So either you believe everything we've said is a lie, or you believe it's the truth, and you're just putting on a show. The number of times that I've seen you without the mask and the situations you're in, I tend to believe it's more, than a, more of a show, OK? But you can put on your show. I don't care. You want to pretend to be protecting each other, that's fine, OK? But our kids, they don't want to be clowns in your little circus. They don't want to be part of this show that we're stopping COVID by acquiring respiratory disease and by acquiring marks on our face and sores. Um, but you still wear those. If you want to put on a show, that's fine. The problem is you're not only inflicting the harm that we're telling you, the lower oxygen, the recirculating bacteria, you're not only inflicting that on yourself, you're inflicting that on our kids, but, but you're doing something worse. You're using this mask, this useless mask, to build a wall between a school district that badly needs help and hundreds of parents who are, have shown they're willing to step up and say, here, I'm here to help. But you guys want to keep building the wall between us with this useless rag. By the way, at the end of the Emperor's New Clothes, the tailors, they're all found to be frauds. The king, he's found to be an idiot. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mr. Quinn. You're welcome. May I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Mr. Vice President. Director Snyder. I move that the board accept the consent agenda as presented. Have a second. Second. Motion made by Director Snyder, second by Director Potts. Call for the vote. Director Snyder. Yes. Director Potts. Yes. Director Poston. Yes. Director Kleindrone. Yes. Director Beck. Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. Bills. Madam Vice President, you oh, skipped me. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were in the sky, President Gosa. And your vote is? Yes. Motion passed. <laughs> Approval of bills. May I have a motion? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the following resolution. Resolved all claims presented to the board having been duly certified as correct by the treasurer, reviewed by the administration and board members, and they are hereby audited and allowed as just claims and warrants drawn on the treasury for the several amounts. Further resolve the payment of claims and salaries be approved as presented for periods of October 20th, 2021 through November 2nd, 2021. Have a second. Second. Motion made by Director Beck and second by Director Potts. Call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Snyder? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Gosa? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. The superintendent's report, we've already done that with the exchange students, which was a nice presentation. Um, any committee reports, po policy? Um, we have a number of policies coming up, but I don't think there's any specific report that I need to make. Okay. We'll move on to items requiring action. May I have a motion for 10.01, the SBRC request. Ms. Vice President. Director Snyder. I move the board approve the application to the SBRC um, and all exhibits 
with minor changes in exhibits, if any, via the SBRC for the amount of $417,199.42. Mayor, have a second? Second. By Director Poston, is there any discussion? I call for the vote. Director Schneider? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Klein Jerome? Yes. Director Gosa? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. May I have a motion for the AEA director ballots? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. Um, I move to nominate Vice President Linda Hayes to cast the Davenport School Board's weighted vote for the Mississippi Bend Area Education Direct, excuse me, Area Education Agency Board of Directors. Election Area Education Agency number nine as follows. Samantha Marie Nagel, candidate for election director, district number one, and Daniel Gosa, candidate for election director, district number two. May I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Director Beck? Um, I've had a couple questions from people about uh, whether it is uh, typical for sitting members of the school board to also serve on the AEA board. And so I was wondering if either the superintendent or Mr. Decker could just address that. We're lucky enough to have Mr. Decker here, so I think he's the most qualified <laughs> to answer this question. Thanks for the question, Director Beck. Um, so this this uh, election is covered directly in Iowa Code 273, and your question is addressed by 273.8 subsection C, and it specifically says that uh, a board member has to be yeah. a resident district. So in, in, in this case, the question would be a resident of District 2, uh, and uh, has to, to fill out the form to make themselves a candidate, which both of those candidates have, have met both of those qualifications. The subsection also specifically says that a uh, AEA director can be a member of a local school board, but cannot be an employee of a school district. So, and that would include the AEA. The AEA is technically uh, addressed in, in a different subject, subsection a school district as well. So it, it cannot be a an employee of any district that we serve, and it cannot be an employee of ours, but it can be. Now, you asked if it was typical. Um, I would say that it would probably lean to be less than typical, but not unheard of. Our, the, the, two re the two districts that we're talking about have actually been represented by members that when their terms started were members of the Davenport board at that time. Okay. And uh, those are the only two in my, this is my ninth year at the AEA, and those are the only two board members we've had that have been members of local boards. I have had that conversation in the past with uh, members of the State Board of Education, members of the Department of Education, and my peers, and it is not seemingly uh, unheard of or, or drastically unusual, but also not the most common. Mm -hmm. It is very directly legal. The, it's not even an interpretation. It says specifically in 273.8C that a, a director of the AEA can be a member of a local board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Were there any addition? No questions? Okay. Okay, we'll call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Schneider? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Kleinsrum? Yes. 
And I'm assuming that Director Gosa is abstaining. Yes, I am abstaining. And my vote is yes, motion passed. Ten point zero three. We've already had discussion on the policies. May I have a motion? Madam Vice President. Director Beck. The policy committee recommends that the board approve policies 602.01, 602.02, 602.03, 602.04, Six oh three point zero one, six oh three point zero two, six oh three point zero three, six oh three point zero seven, six oh three point zero eight, six oh four point oh one, and six oh four point oh two. That was quite a few. A second. May I have a second? Okay. Second. Oh, I'm sorry, six oh three point ten as well. Okay, thank you, Brenda. A second? Second. Any discussion? I, I just have a question. Um, are there policies that are 603-04-05-06 that we're going to put in there with the gaps? Or is it renumbering? Or um, So we have those policies 603. Oh, I'm sorry. You're asking about um, the ones that are missing from that list where there's a space in the numbers. Yeah, we have like Yeah, so on. typically what that means is either the policy committee decided it wasn't applicable to our district, um, but in order to keep the IASB numbering system, we just skip over that number so that if they issue updates to other policies, we're on the same numbering system, or it's something that we are having reviewed by administration or legal or something like that. So when we've skipped numbers, it's not because, um, it's typically because as we get to these in sequence, because we're doing them mostly in sequence, it's either being reviewed or it's one that's not applicable. And also 605 will be up for discussion for our first discussion here. Anyway. Yeah, or, or we're, we, we're getting to it because we've gotten it back. Well said. Director Snyder. Or it could also have a different number. And when we move it over to the IASB numbers, then it will take on that number down the road. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Director Gosa? I don't have any. Okay, call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Snyder? Yes. Director Gosha? Yes. Director Kleinstrom? Yes. Director Poston? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion passed. Items for discussion 11.01 .01 policies. Director Beck? So these are a number of policies for our first discussion. So for our first one is 603.5 five on health education. We currently have a policy on this because it is mandatory. Um, and uh, the policy committee asked um, Lisa to speak to uh, its language and make sure that it fit with um, current language and what we actually do in the district. And so this is what we have now. Again, this is a mandatory policy saying that we'll have health education and it will cover these areas of students' health. So I will entertain any questions. Oh, and currently it is our policy number 604.05. It's not that different. Um, we do also have um, what comes with the IASB one is a template for an opt-out form because parents do have the right to opt out of part of health, any part of a health education. Okay, so the next one is policy 603.09 on academic freedom. And this policy 
is not mandatory, but is strongly recommended. We did uh, check to make sure that it was current with regard to uh, the most recent, recent legislated changes. Um, and uh, our prior policy was not um, as well defined as the one that the IASB template provides. So the policy committee thought this would be um, appropriate and better language and it meets all of the current um, legislative requirements. Okay. Um, the next one is on foreign students. This is a policy that basically just says uh, when students are going to attend our schools, um, they have to meet certain entry requirements. We already have uh, something like this, and um, it's, it's basically for foreign exchange students typically. Um, and it's not different from what we do in practice now. Okay, and then the next one is our homeschool assistance program policy. This is on uh, policy number, it will be policy number 604.09. Um, basically this policy states that uh, we do uh, have a homeschool assistance program and um, we already do this so this is a um, this is basically uh, just the same policy that we already have in place it'll get a new number okay and then finally for first discussion we have um, policy 803.02 lease sale or disposal of school district buildings and sites and this one is not in the typical order because uh, we reviewed all of the policies um, that the state auditor suggested we review um, because that came up just recently and so this is one of them so when we get to this when we get to the 800s as a policy committee we will already have completed working on this policy so the um, uh, policy committee thought that the language in the IASB template was uh, acceptable and provided enough flexibility. Um, and so this is what we are bringing to the board. Any question? Director Postion. Yeah, on, on 803.02, um, I'd like to see some language in there that any sale of a school property is sold to the highest bidder. Director Snyder. We talked about that at the policy committee and we were concerned about that being restrictive. I mean, there's ways we could say it, but maybe, you know, the highest net offer, because if somebody comes in and say gives you a $2 million bid for a building, but they put a stipulation in there, they want a roof on it. And then somebody else comes in and says, I'll give you 1.8 million for it. Well, we're bound now to take the highest bid and the roof is going to cost us a half a million and we just sold the building for less. I mean, there's ways to word it in there, but in the past, I mean, we have a board of seven people and that's why you have seven people is to kind of argue that at the table. But certainly if, if the board wanted something in there, I would just recommend that it be something about, you know, net sale of the building or something. So that I, you're not bound. I, I'd, be, I'd be fine with that if you want to go with a net sale, but we've got to have something in here because I don't want to happen again what happened here in the past, okay? Uh, Superintendent Schneckloff. One of the other things that we talked about was if, and we, we brainstormed a bunch of odd businesses that might not be good for the community, if they were the highest bidder, that might bring the wrong business into the community might be another reason why a board might not take the highest bidder if someone were bringing something in there that would be counterproductive to the community that was another consideration um, for this policy as well go ahead we got to be thinking about our current finances okay so when the properties get sold we need to get as many dollars as we can out of them 
so we can turn around and invest that in our other structures or other buildings. So I don't know how else you can do that and not go through what we've gone through in the past. Um, so given that this is first discussion and we'll have to re-meet as policy committee, um, so I would suggest maybe Director Postgen, if you have some language that you can share, that you have an idea of what you wanna share, or if you wanna to come to our policy committee meeting, our next one, and brainstorm with us to see if we can't figure out a way to do this. Um, because really it's a matter of not restricting the board to situations that might end up potentially being detrimental. Uh, Director Potts. Well, I believe in most of our bid policies, we say that we have to accept the highest responsible bidder. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of wording that I think would be appropriate here, the highest responsible bidder. Because we have a fiduciary responsibility when disposing of school property to get the maximum value for that property. That's our, that's our moral and legal responsibility. Director, or Superintendent Schneckloff. <laughs> I think that that, kind of language would do it. I think of the old, is it, the, was it the old Madison or Taylor School down there by Smart that sat bank? Sorry. See, Josh Romanski is one of the few people that my phone will ring for, so it's, it, it, luckily it's not him. A pipe has not burst somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that was what was coming to my mind, that building that said somebody bought it and they house their animals out of I, I don't I don't remember what exactly it was but it, it now is a has been bought restored and is, is a so I, I think that language would cover it and and allow um, for the exact con concern that director Postion is saying so I, I think that should be added to there okay so maybe what we'll do is um Brenda, have you written any of this down or do you need okay so <laughs> good because I didn't get it written down um, what we'll do is bring this back to the policy committee and um, try and, and include that language so that we are getting at the intention that Director Postion has. And um, of course, we'll run it by uh, legal sure. and our policy committee uh, guru, Siobhan, <laughs> to make sure that we are not being too restrictive or too uh, unrestrictive and Hopefully we can come to some sort of comprom compromise there that works for all of us. Okay, sounds good. Any other discussion on the policy? Okay, Superintendent Snuckhoff, are you gonna lead the discussion today? Yes, today we have um, Lieutenant Smith with us and Dr. Barney are going to join us at the front table. Dr. Barney, if you wouldn't mind grabbing a couple microphones for this, for this conversation. Oh, thank you, Dr. Schneider. Um, Today, we are going to be reviewing the SRO data that is public on our website. Um, as we start our conversation, uh, I've asked Dr. Barney to kind of to kind of set the stage for what does this data mean and in regards to our to our MOU and things of that nature. So, um, yeah. so Dr. Barney uh, and Lieutenant Smith, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. And Dr. Barney, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off with just kind of a, in our schools, um, what does this mean? Well, how is the MOU uh, moving forward? So thank, thank you both for being here. And uh, Dr. Barney, thank you. Certainly. Um, the SRO uh, relationship uh, with the schools starts as more than just the services that end up being the end result. It, it, we know that there are certain um, members of our community who do not feel connected with our law enforcement agencies. And so it becomes very important to identify as many positive opportunities for us to connect. And so, uh, Brenda, if you can open up uh, the, oh, he's got control. Okay. All right, beautiful. If you can open up the Yeah, they, they gave report. me control of the mouse. So. Uh, what do you want, Dr. Barney? Uh, your your uh, report, yep, that school resource monthly report. And so we know. Yeah, I got to refresh it. 
that the relationship uh, that can be established, there are multiple uh, positive opportunities to, to make connections with um, students and staff prior to uh, the law enforcement side. And so I really want to emphasize as we're looking at these documents, the green and yellow categories that center around the educational experiences and the relationship with experiences. Each of our buildings um, has a uh, behavior uh, management or behavior support system that exists uh, with this continuum that starts um, all the way through the, the first point of contact, whether it's a, a teacher, uh, para, administrator, kitchen staff, wherever it may be, clerical staff, um, all the way that extends and then uh, some of those incidents or those events um, also includes opportunities for the SRO to be supportive uh, of supporting that student or supporting students, families, um, staff in dealing with that situation. Uh, but the majority of that work, we want to really center on that right side there with the education and relationships. But we also know every now and again, things begin to creep over uh, into that other category in the safety category. Um, where those uh, the administrator or building staff, uh, the particular event has exceeded um, the 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 level of support that those administrators, the building administrators, can provide. The SROs interactions are, are beginning stages of supporting those are kind of at the direction of uh, the administrator. What we do know is there are times where the SROs, just by their their presence in the building, will come across incidents or situations that they may. Uh, support, but then they end up turning over many of those back over to the administration to kind of finish up dealing with what they do. And so, uh, Lieutenant Smith will will kind of talk about more of those things as we go through um, this process. But at this point in time, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Smith to kind of talk about uh, the the data and what's there. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Barney. So. Uh, what you all are looking at here is actually the city website. Uh, as promised, as part of the MOU, we we're going to post monthly uh, data and activity of the SRO program. We came here in August to give you guys uh, kind of a snapshot of what that looked like uh, with some data from the spring. So um, if I could back up here just for a second. So this is the city website, and there's a link on the district website as well, taking, um, <coughs> taking the, the user to this screen. So up at the top here, we have a, a quick school resource officer question and answer. Um, this gives some really good information about who pays for the SROs, what do the SROs do, where they assign to. Um, it's a good little just a, a check-in resource for anybody that's looking for some information on the school resource officers. Um, there's a school resource officer glossary of terms. We wanted, we thought it would be a really good idea if we're talking about this data. Um, you know, as police officers, sometimes we we, we talk. We cop talk. We call it cop talk, and people don't understand what we're talking about. So, um, to to put some of these this data into context, we want to make sure that people know what we're talking about. So, what better way than just a quick glossary of terms? This is what the lieutenant's talking about when he says, "What's a call for service? What is what does that mean?" So, um, and and I'll let, I don't need to go through all of this, but um, all of that stuff is here. So, um, along with that. Um, the MOU is here as well, so people can compare that. And then uh, the monthly report. So you can see that we've already got the September report is in here as well. And then the October report. I, didn't, I don't think I need to open that again. But, um, so here's kind of, um, this is the report that we showed you earlier. There's uh, been a little bit of uh, tweaking to it, but this is a school resource officer monthly report. And this is meant to be kind of like a 3,000 foot view of what's going on with the SRO, uh, SRO program as a whole. And then um, attached to this as well is the raw data that everybody was clamoring for. People want to know um, the numbers. What are the numbers? So um, they're, they're broken down by school here. Um, and this is where I pull all the numbers from, the juvenile charges by type, um, juvenile charges by race, uh, use of force by type, and then um, use of force by race. So um, there's, we got year to date totals that we're, we're tallying as well, um, so that we can keep track of this. And the idea of this, is, as you recall, was, was to be able to pivot, right? The SRO program, we want it to be a moving document, that, or a living document that we can change the, the program. So. Are we okay? <laughs> Is she okay? 
Okay. <laughs> I, I, if I need to go in emergency mode, I will. <laughs> Okay, so um, I just wanted to give you guys a quick, uh, a quick overview of October. Um, I wanted to focus on October tonight, but at the top here you have uh, the three tenets of the SRO program, the, the, the three staples, the three pillars, the safety of uh, educational relationships. That's as outlined by NASRO. Um, all of our officers are, are trained through NASRO, the National Association of School Resource Officers, um, as outlined per, per the uh, MOU. So on the left there is um, safety. So calls for service, um, there was 106 calls for service in October. And as you can see, we tried to outline this as, as kind of a bucket theme, right? So you have a call for service and then, you know, that gets filtered out. Either it's handled by the school ultimately or it's handled by the police officer. And then how is it handled by the police officer? So we, we tried to keep distilling that down, you know, to, to give uh, what, what an outcome was. Um, as you can receive, uh, see, the 72 of those were handled by an officer. Um, resolved by 66. Now, resolved by a police officer means that nothing else came of that, right? Like it stopped there. There's no more investigation. There's no more that the officer was able to handle whatever that incident was right there. Um, there was four uh, charges that were diverted to diversion. Uh, that's the Scott County program, uh, Scott County Juvenile Court Services program, uh, different from detentions program. And then um, that we talked about earlier tonight. So then incidents resulting in charges, two. So we had uh, two individuals were charged um, with crimes. One of them was a weapons charge, and then one of them was, a, um, was an assault, was a serious assault with injury. So we had two charged. Two individuals were charged in the month of October. And then compared to September, it was uh, nine. Um, we can certainly go back and look at those numbers um, if you want. But the majority of those were, were assaults as well in you September. Yeah, August and September together. Yep, we combined August and September together because it was five weeks of data. Uh, P3 campus tips, uh, 65, uh, the, the middle schoolers, uh, or sorry, the junior high school kids, uh, we get a lot of campus tips from, um, they're great. Uh, a couple of them have really panned out. There's, there's, we we got to sort through them. Uh, there's no doubt there are some that are still we're getting um, anonymous tips on bad teachers right? <laughs> bad teachers uh, making us do stuff so uh, but the majority uh, there we've had a, a couple of really good tips that have led to um, recovery of a weapon um, and then um, even some some students going through depression and suicide hurt, harming themselves um, that we've been able to uh, then then get counselors in touch with um, and, and use some other resources. So it's been a really good tool for us. Um, we're proud of that. Um, on the education uh, side, we're in, we're in the classroom laws and you, this is, this is still kind of slow. I know we're working with the district right now to figure out exactly where our classes fit into curriculum wise. Um, so uh, it's, that's probably the piece of this that needs to, to get moving most for me. Um, but the SROs, are, they're in the classroom. They're, you know, they're in French class. They're stopping by PE class. They're in, in special education. They're at ROTC. Um, they're, the, the guys are in the classroom meeting students and trying to form some relationships on that side. So, um, and then the third pillar, last pillar is the relationship side, uh, 51 mediations. And I, I can give you some examples of that. Um, just one home visit. Um, other outreach. These are, these are the outreach. Other outreach are... are or non-programmatic other outreach. This is just um, the SROs being part of these kids' lives, right? It could, and uh, I just, there's some examples there. I could go on and on about these, but uh, Corporal Antle attending the, the Marching Blue Devil performance, that's uh, dear to my heart. I got two boys that march for the Blue Devils. Um, and working with the Sheriff's Department to donate a bike to a student in need. It's just uh, the, the facilitation and the relationship that these guys, um, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what they're doing. So working with the 180 zone, um, the new youth assessment program, I think is going to be big for the district and us as well in our community. Um, homecoming dance, just there, there's some really good notable um, stuff in there. So um, with that, you want to talk a little bit about the handle with care? Yeah, Handle with Care. I know we've covered this before. Um, Handle with Care is just, it's, it's a program uh, that the police department 
uh, uses when we go to a call um, where, where kids may have a, um, an interaction, right? Or some kind of, um, um, searching for the words, but um, some kind of a big deal, right? Uh, the police may show up at their house, some kind of, uh, they, they then report that to the district so that the, um, so that the people that need to know about those kids, they may be acting differently in the classroom um, that they can have other sources um, so that they, they can know that there was, a, there was maybe a traumatic event that happened in their life uh, the night prior that they may not be acting the same so that we can just give them special need. And there's nothing about what happened specifically. It's just a, it's just a heads up. It's just a communication piece between uh, the teachers and, and the police department. Yeah. Can I chime in on the hand of the chair real quick? Yeah. yeah. So what, what is great about the hand of the chair, what I like about it, and when I was when I was the uh, uh, liaison for the district, we we struggled. We struggled at times with reminding officers get that information to us. It doesn't take them very long, but it's just we keep having to re-educate them because they do get so busy on the street. But the great part about the program is that it is the idea of it is that we have this kid that comes to school tired, mad, sad. Well, if he's coming to school mad and then he has discipline issues you know, maybe we're going to handle him different now, knowing that we've got to handle with care on this kid. Something happened last night. And and again, we don't share, the, the police department doesn't share any information as far as what kind of call it was. It's just that, hey, this child, a family member, somebody was involved with the police last night. So it's just that, again, it, it's it's almost like a diversion program in itself that this kid doesn't end up with a discipline issue. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Thank you. Just nodding. Real quick, how is that information like relayed to the district? Is it initiated from the parent or is it initiated from the uh, department? Uh, police department, police officer on the call. So they go back, There's a, they just enter the system into a program and then uh, the emails are sent to, um, I think, I don't, know if, I don't know who gets those emails right now. Dr. Clips, do you still get those emails? I do, well I get the central region one. Okay. Um, it's kind of it's kind of neat to see the the emails throughout the day. They go, oh, this is a Davenport student. No, this is a Bettendorf student, and then then they claim and they kind of rally around around that and get the information to where where it needs to be. Director Kleinschmidt, um, and I guess this goes to you. Okay, so you get the email, but then where does it go? Because I worry that it's really not getting to the teachers. Yeah, I'm, I'm only copying because I don't know my glasses. I stole the pencil. <laughs> I am only on as being copied on the email. So it goes to the principal of the school um, who is then, um, and I think sometimes a counselor, um, but then it's the, their responsibility to call, you know, check, make, just be aware that that students had a rough day, uh, whatever the situation was the night before, that there was a handle with care for that specific th sake, just saying, handle the student with care today, or if there's something going on, keep an eye on the student. So it's not, I don't then forward that along and have other actions to do with that. It's it's um, it's the it's the principal and counselor at the buildings that that take action when they see those. But again, my concern is that teachers are not being told handle well, with care with this student because they're seeing yeah. them. They need to know that again. They don't know this need the specifics. They need to know that there's something going on because the counselor does not always tell the teacher. The administrators do not always tell the teacher they're out of the loop and they have no idea what's going on. So you're, you're being reflective of an elementary student at that point, potentially. And then at the middle school, you're talking additional six teachers and then high school. And so I, I think that, that, that is the next step that the building administrator and the counselor would take is those working most directly with that student would then receive that information. So, yeah, yeah, that's what I want to make yep. sure they, yep. they get it. Yep. Yep. It's similar to the, the P3 communications that come in as well. Um, every, once they come in, uh, we as the, the region, uh, regional person get it, the building principal gets it, counselor gets it, and then it's their next step to, to identify who are the folks that need to be involved with this information and then going on from there. It may be a situation that it's, it names it specifically. In math class, Steve continues to pick at me and make fun of me. One that came in today, I kid you not, said, um, uh, continues to calls me double O. This particular student continues to call me double O because I spelled restroom with one O. Okay? 
well, we know who the two students who are involved. We then connect with the teacher that would be connected with that and try to pay attention to a little bit more of that information as it comes through. So um, it's identifying who's closest, closest related to that situation that can support the student through that. Director Barrett. Um, one question that I had um, was about in the, in the raw data, um, and a couple people have asked me about this too, West High School is not included in that. And no, I know it's because North. they don't have, I'm sorry, not North. West, uh, North, sorry, North. North High School <laughs> is not included in that. And um, I know they don't have a uniformed dedicated SRO, same with Mid-City. Um, but I think there are some people in the community who would like to know sort of what's going on there as well, and potentially use that as a baseline for comparison to what we have going on right now. Um, can one of you guys speak to that? I'll speak to it because new eyes create new questions. And so when I saw this data, that was one of the very first things I asked was, hey, why is there no data here from North? And obviously there's some other places that we're missing some data from. Um, and that is because of how we are currently, currently allocated with those SROs. We have identified within the MOU um, and through a conversation with the superintendent that there's some potential adjustments that need to be made. Um, but basically, the, these SROs that are in these location at these locations have specific training on how to pull this information and how to communicate it, whereas North, North is being supported by uh, off-duty regular officers um, who don't have the training or the way to produce this data and get it transferred over. So we are exploring that. So great question. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Beck, I would just add that, um, you know, the, the MOU only covers the schools where the SROs are assigned. Yeah. So um, we, we could run some data, but if we use the word baseline, I don't think we're comparing apples and apples. We're comparing okay. apples and oranges. Um, we, we've got officers uh, at North, although they're, they're, they're good officers, they mm -hmm. hire good people, their, their mission is slightly different. So if we start collecting data about what they're doing there um, and not being full time, I just, I, we're not getting a very good baseline. So there, there are some ways we can run some numbers, um, calls for service at North High School to, to maybe help you make a decision about whether you wanna put an SRO there at North or maybe even reassign or whatever you wanna do. Um, but you just gotta remember that's the data that you're getting, mm -hmm. so. Well, I, I, to go a little deeper with what we've talked about, the MOU is the best practice that we have in the country right now around SROs. So there's no need to go gather baseline. There's no need to do that stuff. It's, it's implemented. The, this is what the best practice shows are, if, if the board in the district still decides to move, continue forward with SROs with the success that we're diverting and all, all of the wonderful data here, then the MOU is, is the way to do that. And so that's the conversation that we're talking about, um, ensuring if we have SROs in our schools, in our school district, that there is an MOU that we all operate underneath and that we're transparent about it. So that's kind of where we're, we're looking at um, shifting resources the best as possible without disrupting service right now because where where you move from a where you move from b it really affects the rest of the system so um, those are the conversations that we need to have um, because the mou is the best practice and i first of all i want to thank you for doing a lot of that research on that lieutenant so it's been very helpful any additional director snyder Actually, I wanted to apologize to you guys. I asked that question, and um, actually, I should have let you finish your presentation. I did not mean to derail you with questions before you were done. So um, I think we would be best served right now as a board to let them finish their presentation and then continue with questions. So I apologize, guys. Yeah, no no apologies needed. I, I was about done. The, the only, um, I know another question that comes up, the North High School question has come up uh, quite a bit as we started presenting this data. Um, the only other thing is like what kind of calls for service are we actually handling inside the school? Um, so I have a, I have a quick list here of just to give you guys some um, ideas and 
the the number one is disturbances. I mean, it's just that that encompasses fights or uh, assaults. That that's the large majority of just students not getting along. We break up fights. Our use of force um, that we use is all related to breaking up fights um, inside the school. Um, there's there is in this in this month there was um, a couple of harassments, uh, bullying type of stuff, um, a couple of assaults, uh, suspicious calls, both student and adult. Uh, trespassing. We've actually handled a couple accidents. Um, one being a pedestrian that got hit um, is okay. It was a minor deal. And then um, parking tickets. Uh, there was criminal. There was uh, one report of a criminal damage too inside the school. One of the students that was uh, handled back to the school. So, just to give you an idea of, of the type of calls that are being handled you know, by a police officer that administrators wouldn't normally do. I mean, that's why there's a need for the, the police. I believe that there's a need for the police officer to handle th those types of calls. So, Director Beck. Um, I guess the next question is, um, you know, once we've had a couple more months, are we seeing improvements, especially if we include things like the restorative mediation, which we heard about, um, so that all of all of the numbers on the the left side there start going down, mm -hmm. um, and that we start seeing proportionality in terms of the number of students who are involved in those types of things so I think for me uh, if you can oh, well you're kind of down at the bottom I think the most oops sorry go sure. back up I was looking at the the bottom box here um, underneath handled by the officer um, I think the most important pieces uh, that in regards to the big concern is how many charges emerge and seeing a reduction in the number of charges that emerge um, and um, how many opportunities for diversion, uh, keeping in mind that the diversion program is designed to avoid those charges uh, manifesting themselves. And so if we can keep those numbers low um, and, and pushing that forward, that's a, that's a win for us in the end. Um, having our, I, don't, I don't see a major concern with having our officers, if needed, um, to begin assisting in some of those some of those conversations and there may be places where we just can't control the charge Because a family has elected to push the charge issue. We didn't request it as a building We felt like we were able to bring resolution or mediation to the situation uh, But they were kind of forced to show up based mm -hmm. to there was a criminal act and it did mm -hmm. Support a charge being filed um, and but if we can continue to keep those numbers low um, the the upper categories of what it gets pushed back over to the school and what the officers are able to assist us in processing through. If we have a very angry and volatile parent that's on campus and it's exceeded the administrative ability to, to resolve that, if they can get that parent to leave willingly and process through it and no charges were filed, that's a win for the school as well as for the parent yeah. when it's all said and done. Yeah, I would just say we, we don't know what we don't know. That's the yeah. beauty of this MOU. And I think we're kind of on, um, we don't know what the future holds. That's, that is why we did the MOU. So I'm, I'm surprised every time these, uh, we put these stats together. Um, I, I don't know where the stats will go, but we're keeping them and it's going to help us make decisions in the future. And I think that's a, it's a great thing yeah. for you guys and us. We do know that as the uh, gets a little bit colder outside, folks right. interact a little bit less outside, <laughs> um, and that will help our data as well. And then as it gets warmer, hopefully the data will remain. Yep. Director Potts. <clears throat> when we were developing the MOU initially and ultimately, we were trying to change the the role of the SRO <laughs> and, and sort of cleave it a bit away from being an assistant principal in the building. I guess my, my question, and I don't know if you have enough data or, or time in the new model yet, but what's the reaction of the SRO officers themselves in how they see the job now and their degree of satisfaction or job satisfaction in their jobs now? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a really good question. So I mean, the SROs are unique guys to begin with. I mean, they're in the schools because they want to be in the schools. I mean, they believe in that um, type of vocational work, right? I think it's vocational work. Um, but 
we actually, Dr. Barney and I met on Friday, and we were talking about uh, the behavioral. That was, if, if you remember, when we, we did the, uh, they, people do not want police officers dealing with behavior in the classroom. And I think we all agree that we don't either. And we actually have had uh, a couple of documented cases where the SRO has been pulled into a situation, that, and they go, uh, well, I shouldn't be here, right? Mm -hmm. that, like, this is, this is a behavioral issue, and has been able to reverse that. Um, realizing that by us being there, it creates a, you know, it could create a, an incident where it could be very easily handled by the by administration or a teacher into a criminal matter, right? Not leaving a classroom could be turned into a trespass. So I think those are like small victories for, for the SRO program. And, and to some extent, it's a, it's a shift in philosophy, but, um, you know, these guys have been doing this for a long time. It's just a matter of now we're collecting the data and now we're, we're kind of letting their work shine in a way that it, maybe it wasn't in the past. So, uh, but that's just one example, I think, of, of, of a small victory. Okay. Yeah, you have opportunity or uh, summaries where they'll say contacted by teacher A, reached out to administration, administration dealt with it. And so it, it lets you know that Every now and again, we do have folks that try to circumvent, not intentionally necessarily, but in their mind, they, they go and that our, our SROs are very diligent and intentional about redirecting the right services back into place uh, to support that instead of being pulled into those alternative roles that you talked about. Any additional questions? Dr. Snyder? Um, going forward, what is NASRO's role with our um, um, officers um, as far as like, is it monthly training? I mean, what kind of ongoing support do they get from NASRO? They they have their uh, initial five week just basic training uh, that all of our officers go to. Um, and there is an advanced training. Uh, none of our officers have been to any of that. Uh, but outside of that initial certification, uh, we haven't outlined anything. Uh, and the MOU as, as, requ as a requirement. So um, I, would, uh, I, I would encourage us to look at some other different training opportunities through the DOJ, uh, violence in schools. Um, they're always putting together different seminars, um, homelessness and students. And, and I, think there's a, I think there's other training opportunities that we could provide for our guys outside of NASRO that would be, maybe be a little bit more beneficial. So. Director Gosa, did you have any questions? Uh, no, I do not. Okay, I didn't want to omit you. Okay, that it. Okay, you all, thank you so much for the presentation. With all the controversy initially associated with the SROs, I am glad to hear how positive it's working out and the relationship building. Thank you. Okay, thank you. we're going to take a quick five minutes because it looks like the restorative uh, mediation might be a few minutes so we'll take a quick five minutes and get started again at 25. Yes. Yep. I'm happy to return to answer questions I don't actually have more of a presentation but if there are questions I can come back up okay did you all have any questions about the restorative mediation for Dr. Clips? Director, you can stay there if you want to. Snyder. Yeah, so I guess I missed some of it, how that is sort of like initiated. I mean, you have a, a program kind of a coordinator at the building, I'm assuming. So who exactly is interacting with the students? Let's say you've got two students who are having a conflict. Are you sitting down with both of them at the same time? Is it? Who, who exactly is sitting down with these kids? Yeah, so um, again, in most situations so far, these have been preventative in nature. And so when there is a conflict arising, a teacher might report it to an administrator or the administrator might already know about it. Most likely that's the case. They're coming down because kids have been exchanging words, maybe whatever the case may be. So they will uh, inform me. And then I contact Jeremy Kaiser, who we met earlier, and he brings in uh, Michelle Bancroft is one of them. Um, she spoke and Dave Bondi was here as well. He didn't speak. Um, and they are the two primary community counselors for this program. So they come in. And as Michelle mentioned, 
the students have to say, yeah, I want to be a part of this. This is not like a required, or it's not forced to do it. It's not a, it's not a punishment. It's like, hey, do you want to resolve this? Do you want to, do you want to like take care of this so you don't have to be worried about this? And they say, yes. They come out, they individually meet with each student first to say, let's walk through, because it's a very prescriptive, it's a pres uh, prescriptive program. They don't just sit down and say, let's mediate this. They're trained by someone out of, uh, from a different agency comes in and trained them to be trainers for this. They sit down individually with the kids and say, okay, here's how it's gonna work. Like where I'm gonna ask them these questions. What are you willing to own up to? What are you, what happened from your perspective? Okay, or we're gonna come and sit into this room together. Here are the norms of how this meeting's gonna go. So they do that individually with the students, sometimes at school, sometimes at a different location, whatever the case may be. So the students are prepped and ready to go before they even walk in the door. Then they come in, they sit down together, and then they go through that process, and it's them that do this. In addition to, in some cases, like I've mentioned, we've trained some of our juvenile court liaisons in this work as well. And so they have started, the, the goal being, as we talk about building capacity, that the, the two lead trainers, again, Michelle and Dave, eventually can start to scaffold away from that work so that we have the capacity within our buildings to do this. But for right now, we're really making sure it's done with fidelity each time we do it. So that's kind of the process. And they mentioned um, they have follow-ups with the students. They send an email first off to say, here's what the contracted agreement and commitments from the students are going to be. That's sent to the administrator and myself. I'm not sure if that also goes to Dr. Bart. So it goes to our other ILDs to say, this mediation took place. Here's the agreement from the students. They both came in. They said they agree. They took um, responsibility for whatever it was. And then they'll, they'll follow up. They have people from the diversion programs that says, okay, it's great on one day, but then life happens. So then they might come back on a monthly basis and meet with those same students. Okay, any other things coming up? How's it going? And that's where those continued relationships are built to. So you kind of touched on my other question is on the follow-up. Like what kind of time frame are we talking? You know, so you, you probably have your initial meeting. Yep and then just the, the follow-up to make sure it's resolved and how things are going. But um, what, uh, what kind of time frame like after? Yeah, so really it, it's kind of on an individualized basis based on what's needed with their kids. But in general, they follow up on a monthly basis with the students. They'll come back into the building, they'll meet with them, and that could go on for as long as it's needed. The, the people that come in to do these are excellent at what they're doing. They're trained, not just because they have a big heart, but they have the expertise as well. And they'll have people within the buildings that'll that'll also do those those check-ins with the students as as well. So uh, on a typical basis, they'll come back on a monthly basis. They have a youth advocates that come in to continue to make sure that they're following through with their end of the commitment. And if something does flare up, they'll reach back out to those counselors and saying, hey, you know, like it seems like the tension's kind of rising again, but in in almost all cases, the recidivism is is zero or little to none. Could I add something to that, Dr. Klipsch? And they, they've talked to us about saying, even with that month timeline follow-up, they may be back in school a week later and they like genuinely want to form these positive relationships. So they'll, hey, while I'm here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down and check in on mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. So it, it, it is more than, well, we did our, we did our job. Um, so they have that follow-up plus just looking to build that positive relationships, which is a lot of what we're hearing tonight. Perfect, thank you. You guys did an excellent job of asking a question that I did a horrible job of asking. So <laughs> thank you for interpreting my question. Director Bright. Um, so the, the, the program's voluntary and do we know sort of what percentage of students choose not to participate and sort of how that looks or is it generally some, you know, is it rare that somebody might say, nah, I don't want to do this? Yeah, well, it's um, it's very rare that our mediators get involved and it turns into a no. I think I may have gotten one follow-up email saying, we met with the students, this student was not willing to be a part of it. Now, on the administrator side, when they're talking to the students, I don't, I don't know specifically on those numbers, um, how many times are students like, absolutely not, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure. Um, but again, once w once there is initial interest and we get those mediators involved, and sometimes they just get involved to to try to let the student know, hey, you can say no, but let let's talk about what this looks like. 
Um, and rarely, again, rarely is it a, a, a no, I'm not going to give this a chance. Okay. And then I guess my follow up to that would be, I'm guessing there are a few extremely rare situations where this might not be appropriate. For example, a student bringing a weapon to school or something like that, where they're going to have to be removed for the safety of everyone around them. Um, but those are much, much rarer when we think about it in terms of how can we solve this problem rather than correct yeah if okay. there's if there's a there's a line that if there's a weapon or something brought to school that would not be a situation in the past that we have used uh, used this now well we might again we haven't had that situation yeah. now there might be a case where we say there is a a serious consequence to that and we want to make sure that this student is restored into the community no matter what that consequence is yeah because so we could do it both in both those situations where it wouldn't be one or the other but this and we're also going to try to restore that that would be more of a community circle where say what's the impact on um you know how the the teachers the students and all of those groups but again in this situation we haven't had one of those come up okay well and i know the purpose is to try and reduce removals mm -hmm. and so i appreciate the fact that even if that's warranted anyway which i know again is extremely rare in the situations we're describing that we have the opportunity to still you know wrap around that student and mm -hmm. figure out how we can prevent absolutely something yeah. from happening again. Another example of that would also be um, some areas where we look to expand the use of it. Um, a student has an issue in a class with a, with an adult, with a teacher. Um, they've made some poor choices. There's a consequence for that that may involve them re leaving school, but eventually they're going to return back to school. And so one of my big concerns has always been that we have students who are kicked out of classes teacher felt hurt in that process um, and, and thus removed the student. Student, for whatever reason, they made the choices and decisions they made, f made those choices based on some concerns about the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done in the past is we've taken those kids and just returned them right back to class mm -hmm. blank number of days later. Teacher hasn't healed from it. Student hasn't healed from whatever they were concerned about. And so I've often said, if a student is removed from class, they can't re-enter back without a, a re-entry meeting between the teacher and the student for the teacher to be able to explain, here's why I needed you to leave, and the student to say, here's why I did what I did. Um, and so the two of them could come to a place uh, of reconnection or healing, a restoration of that relationship so they enter back into it as, as closely back together as they can so they can move forward in educational experience for the remainder of the semester. So. That's kind of the expanded way that we're also looking to use these as well. I like that. I think that's a little appreciated part of this whole thing is that when a kid in, in traditional, traditionally when a kid's been removed, you forget that there's a teacher involved as well mm -hmm. and throwing them both back into the same place without any kind of, of Restoration. discussion mm -hmm. is or healing is yeah. not necessarily good for everybody. Yeah. Yep. Director Potts. Of the, you have 138 encounters. Of those, how many have been conflict resolution and how many, and I, ballpark, I don't, and how many have been restorative? Well, both situations are, would be considered restorative, but I think maybe what you're, what I think I'm hearing you saying is how many it was after an incident happened versus preventative. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Like how many were because a fight took place and we're trying well, yeah, to. Yeah, in, in my head, I, I, I look at, at uh, conflict resolution as, you know, Sally and Mary are, you know, they've been snipping and sniping and they got a problem mm -hmm. or Billy and Joe, he took my sneakers or he took, I gave him my locker combination mm -hmm. and now I don't have my math book, you know, mm -hmm. uh, drama. Mm -hmm. okay. Whereas I look at restorative is where, you know, Joe stole something from, stole his phone or uh, um, Mary punched Sally in the face or um, there's been serious online harassment and bullying and threats being made. So I, in my head, I, I sort those out. Yeah. And I'm, I guess but the premise of my question is that would it be safe to assume that 
a restorative justice as I've just described it encounter would take more time than a conflict resolution. Yeah, it sounds like it's a it's a spectrum that we're talking about because what you even what you were saying a punch is different than someone t- stealing my math book or something like that. So most of these have been more on the preventative side. On the um, it it hasn't been as many of someone getting actually punched. It's avoiding that from happening. Yeah. Um, now it was initially set up in my mind that it would be more where a situation did go down. And we need to make sure that that gets healed. And those those happen. But it, but once we expanded to say, hey, let's not wait for that to happen. If you think some things could happen, let's start inter- intervening earlier. And that's where this is really taken off is that people are administrators, kids, teachers are recognizing. Let's not wait for that thing to happen. And, and so the majority so far have been that earlier one. And to your point. When they do, when, when they do get more serious, it does take more time. And but the the counselors, the people that are doing this, commit to the time it takes to to resolve that in a way that it doesn't happen again. So my 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 other comment would then be, and this is this is just based on my experience at Smart, where we had a conflict resolution program, mm-hmm. and we trained students to deal. In, now they dealt in in the conflict resolution as I described it, mm-hmm. that as as a opportunity like this presents itself, in particular in junior high, it begins to gain traction. Mm-hmm. And then the number of students who want to resolve a problem through this method increases mm-hmm. ex- a lot. Yeah. And if all you have is a handful of people, yep. you're going to run into more that okay you have a conflict okay oh, let's see it's you got a conflict on monday okay uh, i can get somebody here thursday yeah. can you can you hold till then uh, so i think <laughs> and i know you i know you've probably processed this already mm-hmm. but i think there's an opportunity to train students in conflict resolution so that they can handle their own situations you know you give them a clipboard you give your resolution people a clipboard and boy, they're ready to go because it's a scripted deal, as you mm-hmm. said. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think I'm, I'm sure you probably already are going down this path. Yeah. But I, I can tell you, it, it works very well, especially with junior high school kids. I don't have any experience with high school kids. I can tell Dr. Barney wants to say something right now because I just know <laughs> yeah. him well enough. I can feel his energy. So I'm going to let him. Am I right on that? Because I can, I can respond to that. Yeah, no, I, I, think our, I think our brains are very much connected on it. Um, I, I will say one of the things that we started the year this year is we had some uh, in-district staff that hadn't completed the training due to some things that happened last year. They got halfway through and needed to finish that up. And so we have increased our in-district folks um, that are in buildings to be able to do that. So that's one of those steps to get us a little closer to immediate response. Um, and then I think the next conversation always is, is peer mediation. And what does that begin to look like? Um, and equipping students to be able to, to work through some of that stuff, especially in elementary and in middle school and in high school when they can develop those skills. So um, I think it's a next step to the work, um, but I think getting more of our own staff connected and involved with the training is, is the, the next strength or strong step and then moving in with students as a conversation. In, in, in brief here, restorative mediation is one small piece of restorative practices. And um, it, it, in restorative practices, all fits within our PBIS umbrella, uh, as you can, I'm sure, make these connections about how these are positive interventions. Um, but we've just had to, with very careful intentionality, roll this out um, in a way that's not overwhelming, that doesn't strain our system. That's not like, okay, now everyone's going to get trained in this. And now everybody also, you know, so that's, so yes, we would, we want to continue to move in that direction, but do it in a way that doesn't flood everybody's feeling of now we have this other thing, which it it really should be embedded into all that. Um, So yes, peer mediation is really where we want to go, where we can slowly pull those scaffolds away. And then the students resolve this um, individually, um, obviously as a, is a goal. One of the programs that currently exists in the high schools is the MVP program, Mentors for Violence Prevention. Uh, And that program is designed for upperclassmen who are leaders. And it's not necessarily who adults believe are leaders, but rather 
folks who have been identified as others by other students as leaders um, and to take those folks and have them begin to deliver what they call a bystander program and so that bystander program is designed to the the long and the short of it is the majority of us in this room and and everywhere will rarely find ourselves as the victim and we will definitely rarely find ourselves as the perpetrator but majority of us 99.9% .9 of us will be a witness to something happening somewhere and so equipping students to be able to identify those events when they're taking place between other students uh, and being able to intervene in some way that they they whether it's as simple as sharing the information with another adult sharing the information with your own parent or or intervening yourself to say hey that's not cool that's not okay those things are the opportunities that kind of exist themselves with that MVP program. So there are some student activated groups currently in place that can also begin to work their way down to the middle school as well. Anyone else? Director Bosa? No, ma'am, I do not have anything. Okay, thank you. Director Foster? So as ILDs, how are you getting involved? Are you observ observing any of this or taking part, any kind of interaction or what, what's uh, the process there? You know, I have been at a building when the, the, the counselors arrived, said, oh, we're here for mediation. And I did ask, I was like, you know, at some point I would love to sit in. However, when the students are in conflict and they come in and I'm a person they don't know it and you would need to get their permission. And so I haven't sat in on one of these mediations for that reason that um, it could potentially dampen the authentic conversation that takes place. Um, so I'm aware of every single one that take that happens and we keep data on it, but I haven't actually seen it myself um, in place. Director Poshman, um, we do get the summaries um, emailed to us every single time and to date um, I have I have not seen one that has not said please see the attached notes on the successful mediation um, literally a hundred percent of the ones that I've received has said successful mediation and I and I will flip through it I will also say that one of the administrators um, replied all and said thank you so much and this is a seasoned administrator um, and this person said, this is the single most effective tool that we have at our disposal. Um, and so, so we are, we are aware of what's going on, but as Dr. Cliff said, we're not sitting in the room. I am the newbie. And so I get the opportunity to ask a lot of questions right now and people bear with that. Um, and so I've been a part of, uh, talking with some of the folks that are JCS workers who are involved with the mediation and, and being able to quiz them on the process, how it's going, concerns they have, what can we do to support them. Um, I've had the opportunity to set up the trainings. Um, I've also had the opportunity to talk to Jeremy about the program. So I'm kind of on that other side of it. I'm receiving the same information, but because I've been the new guy and helping facilitate some of this, I'm, I'm learning a little bit more about the program. So. Well then, <clears throat> how, how would you say this all ties together with or maybe it doesn't, uh, CRVP and PBIS. What is, you know, how, how does that all fit together? Yeah, I mean, if you think of, if you, um, I, I mentioned on that, the, the conditions for learning constructs, those five areas, and you can, now that you really hear more about it, student to student relationships, adult to student relationships, physical safety, expectations and boundaries, all those things, like it fits right into that, which is our overarching goal for our PBS work and, CRVP work in general. I um, mean, if you think about PBIS as a system of interventions for to promote positive behaviors, I mean, this is, I mean, that's, a, that's the definition of what we're doing here is, is we're seeing that this is, um, it's an intervention for students that need it, and it's available for anyone. So it's almost a universal um, intervention for any any student that might have a conflict that needs this support. Um, so it, it fits directly into that same work. Any additional questions, comments? Okay, thank you, gentlemen, for following up on that. Any additional board requests? 
I have one here from Director Beck, date of request, November 8th, agenda item. I would like to hear from our district nurse about COVID numbers, specifically in our district. Why are you making this request? It's important to know what the situation is in our schools as we plan our more, <coughs> our mass exit strategy. When would you like it as feasible? I have a second. Second. Second by Director Potts. Okay, any administrative reports? None at this time. Okay, we'll start with Director Snyder with reflections. Well, one, I love hearing from the students for the um, student exchange, but to me, the takeaway for the night is this restorative mediation program. Um, I think it absolutely screams what the community was wanting, what a lot of us as board members were wanting and what was needed is it becomes less about discipline and more about how do we move on? How do we fix it? How do we get you back to learning? And you know, with counselors, with people trained in, in the resolution. Um, I think it's an outstanding program. Um, and when the question was asked, you know, have any of our um, building leaders been involved in that? I can't help but wonder if that wouldn't hurt the mediation because again, you have somebody who's known as a disciplinarian in there and not somebody to resolve the conflict. And I think that's what makes this product so unique to any other intervention we have is that it's not about discipline. So I absolutely applaud you guys on this program and it's absolutely outstanding. Dr. Potts. Yeah, I would say the restorative justice program, especially the conflict management portion, because that that has the ability of doing two things. One, giving kids an outlet, a place to go where they can solve a problem. And two, it teaches them how to resolve a conflict in a way that's appropriate and, and can be a skill that they can then apply for the rest of their lives in dealing with their siblings, in dealing with when they're older, dealing with their spouses. You know, you could it can go a long way. Director Clonjo. Um, I, I like the fact that this restorative justice is tied into PBIS, that it, I mean, we want people to know it's not just another something else we're doing. Um, it's the direction we're headed and trying to get um, positive um, <laughs> things going out there um, without being uh, punishment or punitive. Director Posture. I agree with everything that's just been said. Director Beck. Yeah, I think um, we we had a, a, a good theme tonight in, first of all, having our exchange students here was fantastic. It's a great program, and I love that we were able to, to do that again after um, not being able to do that for a couple of years. But... Um, the idea that we are able to support our students and as director Potts said so eloquently give them some skills to be able to continue to resolve these conflicts as they go throughout life and it ties in with pbis that we're already doing it ties in with our le youth leadership teams it ties in with even the um, mou that we have with our sros it's all about relationship building and so that to me was the highlight Director Gosa. Um, I agree with pretty much everything all my colleagues said. Uh, I thought uh, there were some great um, presentations tonight as well as discussion items. So overall, I thought it was a great meeting. Very informative. I think uh, a huge celebration 
is recognizing a, something that is successful in our district and, and um, the MOU that was developed with our SROs clearly lays out exactly the direction that it will go. So I think it's very um, important for us as we move forward to lay out the direction for a program that the board understand it, that whoever we're in here acting with knows and understands that. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's a level of transparency, there's a level of conversation that are occurring and, and it will allow for better decision-making examples being those, those instances that I saw in there where our SROs were going to prom and, and that, that's the direction that we need to have interactions and also the diverting of, of instances. So I think it all boils back to the MOU, the collaboration, you know, go slow to go fast. I think that's how the MOU process developed and I think it's very important. So that's a huge reflection. And the, I also reflect what everybody else has said, positive restorative justice. This is a ditto for me as well with the, um, I like the fact that the young people are empowered to kind of handle their own situation and the relationship building that comes with that. The um, mediators, I guess they would kind of almost, in my opinion, serve that they're safe. You can vent in safe companies. So to prevent a lot of situations, I feel that once that relationship has started, I feel that they'll keep it up through, you know, till they graduate actually, maybe go from middle school to high school and connect with someone that can help them there. And I just think it's nice for the young people to have that outlet within the buildings that they can talk about and resolve their issues. So again, everything, this was a very informative meeting tonight. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. A second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. adjourned.